Hello everyone and welcome to my set review for the Dungeons & Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Limited. So first off, let me give an overview of how I usually rate my cards. So giving some examples from the previous expansion, which was Strixhaven, we can go over all the different tiers. So starting out at the top, we've got the S tier. This is a rating that doesn't come up very often, usually reserved for ridiculous bombs that are very difficult to answer and that can take over a game by themselves. So Professor Onyx, a perfect example. Then next up we get to the A tier, which are still absolute bombs that can also easily win a game by themselves if they go unanswered, but they're typically a bit more easily manageable than the S tier bombs, or maybe not quite as devastating, but still absolutely great cards that I'm happy to first pick and build around. Cards like Leonin Lightscribe comes to mind, Augmenter Pugilist, a card that can easily take over a game by himself. We've got the Dean of Expression that can provide a ton of card advantage and can also take over a game if unanswered. And then moving on we've got the B tier. These are great playables, cards I'm happy to first pick and that pull me towards the color of the corresponding card. Cards like Kelpie Guide that can act as both ramp and removal. We've got uh, efficient removal spells. These are typically uncommons or the very best commons in each color. So cards like Flunk, a very efficient instant speed removal spell. We've got Heated Debate, one of the better red commons in the set. And then next up we've got the C plus tier. These are very good playables that you're rarely going to cut from your limited deck if you're playing that exact color. So Comet Professor, great evasive creature that can apply some pressure, play offense and defense, great card. Skirt Colony, early blocker that becomes relevant in the late game. We've got Eureka Moments, nice two for one card draw spells, typically fall in the C plus category. Then we've got the C tier, which are just decent filler cards. In this category we might see conditional removal spells, cards like Expel, that maybe don't quite fit into every deck since Expel wants to be in a more controlling deck as opposed to a very aggressive deck. We've got efficient pump spells, cards like Big Play is one of the better pump spells in the set we might find in the C tier as well, and then just fine filler creatures like Illustrious Historian that you might play if you need a curve filler for that mana cost. Then we get to the D tier. These are bad filler cards, cards you would rather not play, and you're usually pretty sad if you have to include them. Baroque Befuddler comes to mind. We've got Spring Main Servant. You might consider it if you've got a bit of life gain synergy, but for the most part, a card you want to avoid. Same goes with Novice Dissector. And then the F tier, there's usually not that many F tier cards in Limited nowadays, but a card like Resculpt in Strixhaven comes to mind, a card that's pretty much unplayable, and uh, there's not many situations where you can uh, find a reason to include it. So this is kind of an overview of all my ratings that I'll be using going forward with the Forgotten Realms Limited ratings. So usually a first thing we want to do when going over a limited set is looking at all the multicolor cards as that will inform us whether or not certain color pairs have particular synergies that we should be looking into. Our first multicolor card of Forgotten Realms is Adult Gold Dragon. This doesn't necessarily tell us anything about what Red White is trying to do as a color pair in the set. This is just an absolute bomb that can easily take over a game by itself. So we're happy giving this an A. This is a 4-3 for 5 mana with flying, a lifelink and haste. So this pretty much wins a game if it goes uncontested, makes it impossible for the opponent to race. So it gets an A for me. Next up we have a Bard class. This is the first instance of a class enchantment. So this is a whole new type of card introduced in Forgotten Realms. So the classes usually have an ability when they come into play. In this case, the Bard class costs two mana, a red and a green, for an enchantment that says legendary creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them. At sorcery speed, you can pay a red and a green to level up the Bard class to level two. And on level two, you still retain the ability 
on the very top of the card, but now also legendary spells you cast cost a red and a green less to cast. This effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you pay. And then once you're level 2 you can decide to pay 5 mana at some point, and then whenever you cast a legendary spell, exile the top 2 cards of your library, and you may play them this turn. So all these classes, as we'll see, get more powerful as you level up, and as you sink more mana into them. And they're usually quite strong. Bard class is kind of an exception, as it's a very narrow card that requires you to have a lot of legendaries before it does anything. So it's going to require a very specific deck for it to work in limited, which is not going to come up very often. So I'll give this a D grade, a card that's usually not going to make the deck, but I could see some very rare circumstances under which a Bard class becomes playable. Next up we have a Barrowin of a Clan Undur, a 4-mana 3-3 legendary Dwarf Cleric, saying when it enters the battlefield, venture into a dungeon. Venturing into a dungeon, another new mechanic in the Forgotten Realms set, and we'll get to that in just a second. And then whenever Barrowin attacks, return up to one creature card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield if you've completed a dungeon. So dungeons are this whole new card type that uh, there's three of them included in Forgotten Realms and these are not cards that you have to draft in your uh, draft booster but these are cards that you pretty much get access to once you start playing the games. There's three different dungeons. First one is Lost Mine of Fandelver and uh, dungeons kind of look like this. So you start out at the very top of the card, in this case Cave Entrance lets you scry one. So if you have a card that says Venture into a Dungeon, you choose one of the three dungeon cards, in this case we're looking at the Lost Mine, and you start out at the very top, and in this case we get to scry one. Then the next instance of Venture into a Dungeon gives us a choice of going either to the Goblin Lair or to the Mine Tunnels, and then we have the corresponding effect and we either make a 1-1 one, one token or we get to make a treasure token. And uh, we don't have the option to go into another dungeon, we have to complete the current dungeon before we can pick another one. And so once we complete the entire dungeon and get to the very bottom, which is a Temple of Dumathoin, we get to draw a card in this case. And then there's some cards that care about you completing dungeons, like the uh, Barrow in here, the 4 mana 3-3, three, three that can potentially return a creature from a graveyard to the battlefield if we've completed a dungeon. So black-white, definitely a color pair that cares about completing dungeons. It's a slightly more aggressively slanted uh, color pair, as opposed to some other pairs that also care about completing dungeons, as we'll see with blue-white. So we've got Lost Mine of Fandelver. This is kind of the most basic dungeon, if you will. And on the left side we can see we can make a token, get a plus one counter. On the right side we can ramp by making a treasure token, maybe control the board by shrinking down a creature, and then ultimately draw a card. So completing a dungeon, at least for this first one, is not a bad reward, but overall it's uh, not going to give us an immediate and huge advantage, as opposed to if we complete a dungeon of the Mad Mage, which as you can see, it takes double as long to complete, so it's going to take a lot more instances of venturing into a dungeon before we can complete the Mad Mage's dungeon. But the final payoff here is quite a bit bigger, as we get to potentially draw three cards, reveal them, and then cast one of them without paying its mana cost. So that's quite a reward for completing a dungeon, of course. In the time you can complete one Mad Mage's dungeon, you could have completed two of the previous one. So the main skill in Limited when it comes to these dungeons is picking the right one, as you'll have to kind of assess the situation, see how many times will you be able to venture into a dungeon, how many dungeons can you realistically complete, and how important is it to complete a dungeon right away. And then here we see the final dungeon, which is Tomb of Annihilation, and Tomb of Annihilation is interesting. It potentially only takes three instances of venture into a dungeon to complete it, although that means having to go through the oubliettes, which is uh, pretty detrimental, as you'll have to discard a card, sacrifice an artifact, a creature, and a land if you want to pass through it. So if you're really desperate to complete a dungeon as soon as possible, that could be worth it. So that's what makes these decisions so interesting. 
but uh, Tomb of Annihilation, also nice if you're trying to be more aggressive, as you'll potentially make each player lose life by going through the Veils of Fear and the Sandfall cell. And then eventually Cradle of the Death God will make a 4-4 token as well, so the reward is definitely there if you manage to complete it. So those are the three different dungeons that we can potentially go through. Yeah, I wrote down C plus for Baron of Clan Undur. Definitely a nice reward for completing a dungeon, but it's not always going to be trivial to complete that first dungeon, and for mana for a 3-3 three, it's not particularly exciting. So, you know, a decent card that rewards you for completing dungeons and incentivize you for doing so as well. Next up we have a Brainor Battlehammer for mana for a 5-3 legendary dwarf warrior, saying each creature you control gets plus 2 plus 0 for each equipment attached to it, and you may pay 0 mana rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate each turn. So red-white is all about equipment and uh, equipment synergies, so Brainor already a decent card by itself as a 5-3 for 4 mana, and then the upsides with equipment is definitely worth it, as we'll see some pretty expensive equip abilities in the set. Brain or Battle Hammer, we're gonna give a B as a very solid card by itself, with a ton of potential upside when it comes to equipment synergies. Next up we have Drizzt Do Urden, might be pronouncing that incorrectly, but a 5 mana 3-3 three, three legendary elf ranger in Selesnia with double strike. When it enters a battlefield you get to make a 4-1 green cat creature token with trample, and when a creature dies, if it had power greater than this creature's power, put a number of plus one plus one counters on it equal to the difference. So if the 4-1 trampling cat token dies, then we can put a plus one counter on this creature, turning it into a 4-4 double strike. Uh, it's split across two different bodies, both of which are relevant. Of course, a double striker is the more important of the two creatures and can potentially become even scarier, but that's a lot of power and toughness for just five mana. And that's an easy A, this is a bomb, and definitely an incentive to go green-white, or a card you could potentially think about splashing, even if there's not a ton of mana fixing outside of treasure tokens in the set. Next up we have a Fairy Day, and Devil's Chosen, 4 mana for a 3-3 legendary tiefling warlock, and whenever you roll one or more dice, this creature gains flying and menace until end of turn, and if any of those results was 10 or higher, you get to draw a card. So blue-red is all about dice rolling in the set, and there's a lot of cards that will make you roll dice to determine the outcome of different effects. And uh, yeah, Farid is the perfect signpost uncommon for the blue-red dice rolling archetype. A very nice evasive creature that can potentially provide a bit of card advantage as well. So Farid gets a B. Next up we have another class, Finder class, 2 mana for a rare enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. So already, assuming we have some equipment in the deck, we're getting another card in return. Then if we pay 3 mana we can go to level 2, in which case equip abilities we activate cost 2 generic mana less to activate, so that makes it much easier to move around our various equipment. And then for 5 mana we can level up to level 3 if we're already level 2, in which case whenever a creature we control attacks, up to one target creature blocks it this combat if able, so we can force the opponent into some awkward combat situations. So Finder class is great, assuming you have at least one or two equipment to search up, and the more diverse those equipment are, then the better, as the more modality you get with the Finder class, essentially. Seems pretty great, and a nice build around for the red-white equipment archetype, so we'll give Finder class a B as well. Next up we have a Gretchen Titch Willow, 2 mana for an 4 legendary creature Halfling Druid, and uh, for 4 mana we can draw a card, and then we may put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield. So this is what blue-green is all about, it's about ramping, putting extra lands in play and drawing extra cards, and Gretchen does so perfectly. Great cards to play early, play defense, absorb some uh, damage, and then later take over with the activated ability. So Gretchen's great, and gets a B from me, a nice first pickable card that is worth building around. Hama Pashar, Ruin Seeker, is the blue-white build around card, a 2-3 legendary human wizard, saying room abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time. So now whenever we go through our various dungeons, 
we get to trigger those abilities twice, which is quite a payoff. So imagine getting to the end of a dungeon, especially the uh, eight stage dungeon. We can get quite a reward if we have Hama in play. It's a, a bit more slow paced than the black white variants, which are trying to complete dungeons a little bit faster and are maybe a bit more aggressive than blue white. But nonetheless, they all care about venturing into the dungeons. And uh, yeah, this is a great payoff for being in that archetype. So Hama gets a B as well. Then we have Kalein, a reclusive painter, a 2 mana 1 2 legendary human elf bard. And when the painter enters the battlefield, you get to make a treasure token. So that's an artifact that you can tap and sacrifice to add one mana of any color to your mana pool, which can help you ramp and potentially fix your mana as well. And then other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them for each mana from a treasure spent to cast them. So if we can ramp into a creature, that creature will also get an initial plus one plus one counter. So red black in this set cares about treasure tokens, using treasure tokens for various effects. And if we have the reclusive painter in play, we also get the benefit of additional plus one plus one counters. So that's what red black is all about. Kalein is not, you know, a uh, Super powerful, uncommon, but it's definitely still a worthy inclusion in any red blank deck, assuming you have some more ways to generate treasures. So it gets a C plus powerful card, even if it's not quite as powerful as some of the others we've seen so far. Next up we have a Cridal of Baldur's Gate, a 2 mana 1 3 legendary human elf rogue. So this is the blue black build around card, and whenever Cridal deals combat damage to a player, that player loses one life and mills a card, then you gain one life and scry one. So blue-black is all about trying to hit the opponent with your various creatures, as they will often give you a reward for doing so. And to make it easier to connect with the opponent, we have an additional ability here saying whenever we attack we may pay two generic mana, if we do, target creature cannot be blocked this turn. So interesting to note is that Crindle doesn't have to be attacking for that last ability to take into effect, so we can easily be attacking with a different creature that maybe has an even bigger payoff for hitting the opponent, although most of the time we're going to be pretty happy to hit the opponent with Crindle as well and get those various triggers going. So yeah, blue-black is all about being sneaky and uh, usually has a lot of rogues and death touch creatures which also make it difficult for the opponent to block and uh, this is the perfect build around card for it. So Crindle gets a B. Nice to drop with some very useful evasive abilities. Next up we have Minsk, a beloved ranger, a Naya colored 3 drop. It's a legendary human ranger and when Minsk enters the battlefield create Boo, a legendary 1-1 red hamster creature token with trample and haste. And then we can pay X mana at sorcery speed and then until end of turn, target creature we control has base, power and toughness XX and becomes a giant in addition to its other types. So we can potentially make Boo into a very large creature, it still retains the trample and haste abilities. So yeah, Minsk has a lot going for him, of course. The major drawback is being three colors in a set that doesn't necessarily have a ton of mana fixing. But as a late game mana sink, the ability is very powerful, especially alongside that trampling hamster token. So Minsk at the very least deserves a B, although in a deck with a lot of fixing where you can more easily cast him, he could go up in value, especially if you've got some ramp to sink into the X mana ability. Next up we have a Monk class, another rare enchantment class for two mana in blue-white, and says the second spell you cast each turn costs one generic mana less to cast. So Monk class wants us to be casting multiple spells in the same turn, which doesn't always come up in limited. Uh, maybe you've got one or two turns where you're double spelling, but unless you've got a ton of card draw, you often run out of cards before uh, too long. But the Monk class, as we'll see, can help us double spell more often. On level two, for a blue and a white, we can return up to one target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So most of the time we're going to be bouncing an opposing permanent with this, but every now and then we could also bounce our own creature maybe with a beneficial enter the battlefield ability, which then also synergizes with casting multiple spells in the same turn. And then once we reach level 3 for an additional 3 mana, at the beginning of our upkeep we exile the top card of our library, and for as long as it remains exiled, we can cast this card from exile as long as we've cast another spell this turn. 
We can't play lands that we exile since uh, we can only cast cards from exile, but cards we exiled in a previous turn that we weren't able to cast, we can still cast later. So those cards will accumulate over time, so any non-land cards we exile, we still potentially get access to. And then there might be this one big turn where we cast a flurry of spells with the mana discount as well. So Monk class wants you to kind of play a long game and grind out card advantage. It's relatively cheap to level it up all the way to level 3, and you do get some interaction with level 2 as well. So Monk class isn't bad, even if it requires you to maybe build around it a little bit by including plenty of card draw effects, so you can still be double spelling late into the game. So I like B for Monk class, pretty decent card. Next up is Orcus, Prince of Undeath. X, 2, a black and a red for a 5-3 legendary demon. It has flying and trample, and when it enters the battlefield, you choose one. Between each other creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn. You also lose X life, or return up to X target creature cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and they also gain haste until end of turn. So first off, we can cast Orcus for just 4 mana, if X equals 0, and we get a 5-3 with Flying and Trample, which is already a pretty great deal, as a very high-powered evasive creature that will kill the opponent in a few attacks if it goes unanswered. But we also have the additional upside that if we're in the late game and we have a bunch of spare mana, we can sink quite a bit of mana into the X ability, which can sometimes be a board wipe if we choose the first mode, even if it costs us a bit of life and can sometimes return one or two creatures from our graveyard if we have uh, sufficient mana to pay for it. So Orcus is just a great card, and even if you don't make use of the X abilities, it's still great. So this is definitely a bomb, it gets an A rating at the very least. Maybe not quite an S, it is still a creature that doesn't always do something when it enters a battlefield, and most removal spells will be able to take care of it. So I don't think it quite pushes into the S tier, but definitely worthy of an A and an absolute bomb. Next up is Rogue class. Two mana for an enchantment class. When it enters the battlefield, we right away get the ability saying, whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, exile the top card of that player's library face down. We may look at it for as long as it remains exiled. So we don't immediately get access to those cards. We'll have to wait and level up our Rogue class. On level 2, for 3 mana, creatures we control have menace, so that definitely helps with our various creatures that need to hit the opponent to get certain abilities going. And then on level 3, for an additional 4 mana, we may play cards exiled with a rogue class and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So we may play cards exiled with rogue class, which means we can also play lands exiled with our various rogues. So. You know, assuming you've got a nice mix of maybe some evasive creatures that can hit the opponent without the menace ability, and some other creatures that benefit from gaining menace, then rogue class should be pretty decent. So I like B for rogue class, but it is one of those cards that could easily end up doing nothing if you're too far behind on board. Next up is Shasra Death's Whisper. 4 mana for a 1-3 legendary human elf warlock in black or green. And when she enters a battlefield, target creature blocks this turn if able. And at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay 2 life, and if you do, draw a card. So this is a great example of what Black Green is all about in this set. It cares about creatures dying, stuff ending up in the graveyard, and then using that to your advantage. It's got a bit of a life loss and life gain theme as well, so you've got a lot of life gain cards to offset the life loss in the case of Shastra drawing extra cards. So yeah, this card may seem pretty innocuous, but assuming you've got some synergy, some Death Touch creatures also work very well with Shastra, as they'll be able to trade off for an opposing creature pretty easily, then uh, you've got yourself a very nice card. So I like a B here as a very nice build around in black green, even if the stats aren't amazing. Next up we have Skeletal Swarming, a 5 mana rare enchantment in black green, saying each skeleton you control has trample, attacks each combat if able, and gets plus x plus o, where x is the number of other skeletons you control. Alright, and then at the beginning of our end step, 
we create a tapped 1-1 black skeleton creature token, and if a creature died this turn, we create two of those tokens instead. So, assuming nothing dies the first turn, you get one skeleton, then that skeleton's forced to attack, it's probably gonna get eaten, but then end of turn we get two skeletons. Now it's not an exponential growth, it's not like we keep getting more and more skeletons, we only get two at most. But getting two skeletons each turn means the opponent will be forced to keep back at least two blockers to make sure those skeletons don't get out of hand. And once we get two skeletons, they both attack as 2-1 tramplers, so it becomes much more difficult for the opponent to profitably block two of those skeletons. Yeah, once you get even more skeletons from other cards that maybe are skeletons, uh, this gets even better. And of course, with those skeletons dying, you're also triggering your various cards that care about creatures dying, like the previous card we just saw that can let us pay to life and draw a card. Definitely more of a synergy card than a card that is individually powerful and takes over the game by itself, but uh, it can definitely do some nice work in the right Golgari deck. So I like a B for Skeletal Swarming, not quite bomb status, but can definitely have a very big impact on a game. Next up we have Sorcerer Class, 2 mana for a rare enchantment in blue-red. When Sorcerer Class enters the battlefield you get to draw 2 cards and then discard 2 cards. So this is not card advantage, in fact this is technically card disadvantage since we played Sorcerer Class and then we're card neutral with a draw to discard to. So not necessarily worth it by itself, but we of course get to level it up. And on level 2 if we pay 2 mana we get to make our creatures into mana creatures, at least when it comes to leveling up our various classes and casting instant and sorcery spells, so they can tap for blue and red for those various effects. And then level 3 costs 5 mana, but assuming we have a few creatures that can tap for mana to pay for our class levels, that shouldn't be too difficult. It says whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, that spell deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of instant and sorcery spells we've cast this turn. So the first spell we cast deals 1 damage, the second one deals 2 damage, can potentially add up, although you know, it's not always easy to cast a ton of spells in the same turn if you don't have a lot of card draw effects. So Sorcerer's Class, one of the more tricky classes to evaluate. It kind of wants you to have a few creatures in play to benefit from the level 2, but at the same time you need to have a lot of instants and sorceries to make the third level worth it, and looting with the base ability, you know, while nice if you can get rid of some lands in late game, is not necessarily worth the card. And I'm not super high on it. I think the best case scenario for Sorcerer class is using your creatures to ramp out or cast other classes. And we'll see a bit later in blue there's some very nice classes available that the Sorcerer class can potentially synergize well with. So I think that's kind of where you want to be with Sorcerer class. And I wouldn't necessarily take it super highly and build around it since that's not always going to work out. So I think I like a C for Sorcerer class. It has potential, but uh, I wouldn't go too deep on building around it at first. Next up we have Targnar, Demon Fang Null, a red-green legendary Null for 2 mana. It's a 2-2 and it has the Pack Tactics reminder keyword here. And uh, we'll see this Pack Tactics reoccur a few different times on red and green cards. And it basically means if you attacked with creatures with total power 6 or greater this combat, then a certain effect happens whenever the creature attacks. So in this case, when Targonar Demon Fang Null attacks, if we have 6 or more power of uh, creatures attacking, in this case, attacking creatures get plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. And we even have an additional ability for 4 mana, we can double its power and toughness until end of turn. So we can potentially pay for mana, turn this into a 4-4, and then let's say we're attacking with another 2-2. Two -two. We attack with both, and we get to trigger the Pack Tactics ability and give our creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So yeah, Targonar for a 2-drop does a lot of powerful things, and uh, is also just a good signpost uncommon for the red-green archetype, which is all about these pack tactics. For a 2-drop, uh, Targnar is quite powerful and you're not gonna find many better ones in the set, so I like a B for Targnar. Very powerful red-green 2-drop. 
And then next up is Tiamat, the 7 mana 7-7 seven, seven legendary creature Dragon God that requires all 5 colors. So not a very easy card to cast in limited unless you've got access to a ton of treasure tokens somehow. But we do get a 7-7 seven, seven flying dragon that when it enters the battlefield, if we cast it, we get to search our library for up to 5 dragon cards not named Tiamat that each have different names, reveal them and put them into our hand. And as we'll see, there's no shortage of dragons in the set, both at uncommon and some even at rare and mythic. So I would caution against uh, taking this too highly, but of course a fun card if you can uh, rise to the challenge. So I'm going to give Tiamat a C and uh, we'll see if we can make it work in Constructed at the very least. Next up is Trelasara, Moon Dancer, a 2 mana 2-2 two -two legendary elf cleric in green-white. Says whenever you gain life put a plus one plus fan counter on it and you get to scry one. So this is an upgrade over a Janny's Pride Mate essentially, as we'll get to scry one in addition to getting a plus one plus fan counter, although it is legendary. So green-white cares about gaining life, that is clear after seeing this uh, uncommon. And yeah, Trelasara is pretty decent. Now there's definitely a few ways to gain life in this set, but it's not like we're going to consistently gain one life each turn, so I would also caution against overvaluing this effect and a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two, while, you know, fine, you do need some 2-drops in your deck. If it doesn't get one or two counters is not particularly exciting. So I would go with a C plus for Trelasara. Definitely a nice incentive for the green white life gain archetype, but I wouldn't necessarily first pick Trelasara and then take every card that says to gain life on it, because that's probably not going to lead to the best deck. Next up is Triumphant Adventure, a 2 mana 1 1 human knight with death touch. And as long as it's your turn, the adventurer has first strike. And as you all know, first strike and death touch are a great combo, since if the opponent doesn't have any first striking creatures, and this creature gets single blocked, this is going to win the fight every time. So the opponent will often have to at least double block the Triumphant Adventure before they can take it out, and then we can still choose to take out the opponent's best creature that's blocking it. And uh, why would the opponent care about blocking a one-powered creature? Well, whenever the Adventurer attacks, we get to venture into the dungeon. And as we've seen, venturing into the dungeons can be quite a payoff if you can do it a few times. So. This is another black-white card that is very good at venturing, and uh, yeah, black-white is probably the archetype that wants to complete dungeons as fast as possible, and if you can play turn to Triumphant Adventure, the opponent's going to have a very hard time stopping you from completing at least one dungeon. So I like a B for Triumphant Adventure, even though it's small, it packs quite a punch. Next up is Volo, Guide to Monsters, a 4-mana 3-2 legendary creature human wizard at rare. Says whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, you get to copy that spell, and a copy of a creature spell turns into a token. So 4-mana 3-2, not the best stats, but assuming you can make a few copies along the way, this can easily take over a game. So yeah, Volo seems quite strong. Uh, it will require you to build your deck around it at least a little bit. If you have too many humans, for instance, then this is not going to do anything. And of course there's a lot of wizards as well. So you will have to pick some of the stranger creature types to complement Volo. But uh, yeah, this seems like a very nice card that will easily take over a game if it goes unanswered and if your deck is built around it a little bit. So I like A for Volo, definitely bomb. Next up we have Xenathar, Guild Kingpin, a 6 mana 5-6 legendary Beholder. So this is a brand new creature type introduced in Forgotten Realms. And says, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. Until end of turn, that player cannot cast spells, and you may look at that top card of their library at any time and play the top card of their library and you may spend mana to it for mana of any color to cast spells this way. So the opponent is locked out of playing any instance in your turn, and you get to gain incremental card advantage by casting spells from the top of the opponent's deck. And you also get a 
a 5-6 for 6 mana, so it's not like the stats are terrible. So yeah, Zenithar will easily take over a game if it goes unanswered. So I think that puts it solidly in the bomb category, but not quite all the way up to an S tier. But definitely one of the more powerful mythic rares in the set. So an A for Zenithar. So to recap what all the multicolor pairs are all about, Blue-Black is kind of the sneaky rogues, they're gonna try to hit the opponent to gain incremental advantage. Then Red-White was the equipment class, which cares about various equipment synergies. Red-Green cares about pack tactics, getting up to 6 power and getting in the red zone to punish the opponent. Blue-Green cares about ramping and putting extra lands in play and then drawing cards, making use of that extra mana. Then what's next? We've got Black-White, which cares about venturing into dungeons and completing them as quickly as possible to get various bonuses. Blue-White also cares about venturing in dungeons, but is a bit more controlling than Black-White, so they're slightly different in that way. And then Green-White cares about life gain and life gain synergies to an extent. And finally Black-Red cares about treasures and uh, getting treasure tokens, sacrificing them for various abilities and uh, for various benefits. And uh, Black Green, of course, cares about creatures dying, paying life, gaining life to potentially pay for various abilities. So life and death as usual. So yeah, I think those are all the color pairs covered now. So let's move on to our first white card, plus two mace, two mana artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two plus two, equip cost is three. So pretty nice bonus, even though it's not the cheapest to equip in the first place. And we will see quite a few equipment in this set, so this won't be the last equipment we come across. Plus two mace is decent, not the most efficient card as I've said, but uh, it's always nice to have a few equipment in your creature decks, so you have a few mana sinks to make sure your creatures still stay relevant in the late game, even if they're on the smaller end of the spectrum. So I like a C for plus two mace, a fine playable. Next up is Arborea Pegasus, a 4 mana 2 3 Pegasus with flying. When it enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains flying until end of turn. So, by itself, it's a reasonable flyer that can apply some pressure, plays well with equipment, of course, to make it even better. And giving a creature plus 1 plus 1 and flying can potentially enable a very nice attack that you otherwise couldn't make. Can maybe get in those last points of damage to finish off an opponent as well. So I like a C plus for Arborea Pegasus. I don't think you're gonna leave this out many white decks. Then we have Blink Dog, a 3 mana 1-1 one, one creature dog at Uncommon with a double strike. So double strike, a very nice keyword to pair with equipment that increase its power as it's going to hit very hard. And then it also has Teleport, 4 mana, we can phase out Blink Dog. So if you're not familiar with phasing in and phasing out, it's a bit of a strange ability, but it's relatively intuitive once you see it in action. So once you phase out a creature, you treat it and anything that's attached to it as though they don't exist until your next turn. So if you have any enchantments or equipment or plus one counters on the creature, those will all disappear, at least momentarily, along with the creature. And when the, once the creature comes back, all those things will still be attached to it, so you don't lose any equipment or counters or what have you. So we can potentially use that phase out ability to protect Blink Dog from removal, or we can maybe chum block with Blink Dog on a larger creature and then phase out Blink Dog and still prevent the damage, unless that creature has trample. So that uh, phase out ability is just pure upside on a card that's already potentially decent if you can pair it with equipment or other ways to increase its power. So yeah, Blink Dog seems pretty strong and uh, of course gets better the more you can build around it. So C plus for Blink Dog seems appropriate. Then we have the Book of Exalted Deeds. Three mana for a mythic rare a legendary artifact. Says at the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, you get to make a 3 3 white angel creature token with flying. So that's quite a reward. Problem is, gaining three life is by far uh, 
the most uh, challenging part of this, since there's very few ways to gain three life instantly, other than a big lifelinking creature that can connect with the opponent. And then we can also pay triple white and tap the book and exile it to put an enlightened counter on target angel, and it gains the ability you cannot lose the game and your opponents cannot win the game, can only be used at sorcery speed. So there's not a ton of angels in the set, there's definitely a few, uh, even at common, so it's not impossible to use the last ability, but of course you're going to be putting all your eggs into one basket, and if the opponent does eventually answer your creature with an actual removal spell, then uh, you're going to be pretty sad. So I wouldn't recommend first picking the book of Exalted Deeds and building around it, since you're probably going to end up being disappointed. Of course, a card that might have some applications in Constructed, so might see some play there. But as far as Limited is concerned, I think this is closer to a D, a card that's pretty difficult to make work, and then the casting cost is also quite prohibitive, even if you do get to synergies. Next up we have Celestial Unicorn, 3 mana for a 3-2 Unicorn, says whenever you gain life, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Celestial Unicorn. So this is a more reasonable life gain payoff, similar to the green-white uncommon that we saw previously. 3 mana, 3-2, three, not an exciting card, but as soon as it starts picking up 1 or 2 plus 1 counters, it becomes quite a threat. And uh, green-white is definitely the color pair where you're going to have the most life gain synergies, where you can incrementally gain life to grow the unicorn. Still not super high on this, so I'll probably end up on a C, but it is a fine filler card that gets better the more life gain synergies you have. Then we have Cleric Class, another card that can potentially enable some life gain synergies and that works well with other cards that care about gaining life. It's another enchantment class, this one at Uncommon, only cost one mana to cast, and then we get the benefit right away of saying, if we would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead. Then once we get to level two for four mana, whenever we gain life, we can put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So similar to the unicorn's ability, but we can put that counter anywhere. And then for five mana, we get to level three. So this is a pretty big investment. We're gonna be spending 10 mana total to get to level three but then we can return a creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, and it also is going to gain us life equal to its toughness, which will also trigger the level 2 and level 1 abilities. So Cleric class is pretty slow, and if you don't have any other life gain synergies in your deck, I wouldn't recommend running this, but of course, assuming you have some other life gain synergies, this will start going up in value. So... I'm going to be pretty conservative on Cleric class, but I do recognize that it has potential. So I'm going to give it a C starting out, but um, I'll be definitely looking forward to trying this out and hopefully it will surprise me in a positive sense. Next is Cloister Gargoyle, a 3 mana 04 artifact creature gargoyle at uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, we can venture into the dungeon and as long as we've completed a dungeon, the gargoyle gets plus 3 plus 0 and has flying. So if we don't complete a dungeon, gargoyle is just going to sit on the battlefield protecting our life total. But as soon as we complete a dungeon, a 3-4 flyer for 3 mana is quite a bargain. And of course we also get the additional benefits of venturing into the dungeon. So this is a card that's going to shine in the black-white archetype, that's the more aggressively slanted color pair that cares about completing dungeons as quickly as possible, but of course still going to be good in a blue-white venture deck as well. Uh, I'll go with the C+, not quite a B, since you will need a lot of other instances of venture into the dungeon before it does anything relevant, but in the right deck this could go up to a B if you've got a ton of other ways to venture. So C plus for Cloister Gargoyle. Next is a Dancing Sword, two mana rare equipment that gives the equipped creature plus two plus one and the equip cost is only one single mana. So a three mana for the first investment and then just a single mana to move it around and plus two plus one is a very significant bonus. And then there's even more, 
When the equipped creature dies, you may have Dancing Sword become a 2-1 construct artifact creature with flying and ward 1, meaning that if the opponent tries to target it with a spell or ability, it gets countered unless they pay 1 generic mana. And if we do decide to turn it into a creature, then it's no longer an equipment. So I think the play pattern that's usually gonna come up with Dancing Sword is that you're happy to just keep it as an equipment for as long as possible. As soon as your last creature ends up trading in combat or gets removed, then you can consider turning this into a 2-1 flyer, which can also potentially help you close out the game. But for the most part, you want to keep this as an equipment, where it's a bit more difficult for the opponent to interact with it. But uh, yeah, this card seems amazing. One of the most efficiently costed equipment in the set, and has even more upside besides it. So I think this is a bomb. Don't sleep on Dancing Sword. Gets an A. Next is Dawnbringer, Cleric, 2 mana, 1, 3, and common. When it enters the battlefield, choose one between gaining 2 life, destroying an enchantment, or exiling target card from a graveyard. So we get quite a bit of flexibility. None of the modes are particularly exciting unless the opponent has a powerful enchantment we care about, but it does potentially tie together some synergies for the life gain deck, so that's where you're happiest to main deck Dawnbringer Cleric, and then occasionally you can get a blowout by destroying an enchantment. There's definitely more artifacts in the set that are worth killing than enchantments, but some of the enchantments out there, especially the removal spells, could be worth destroying. So I wouldn't be too upset to main deck Dawnbringer Cleric, but I'm probably only gonna really be happy to main deck it if I've got some life gain synergies. So I think that probably still puts it at a D, but in the life gain decks, this will go closer to a C. Next is Delver's Torch, a two mana artifact equipment, giving the equipped creature plus one plus one. Equip cost is pretty pricey at three mana, but whenever the equipped creature attacks, we can venture into the dungeon. So this will be at its best put on a cheap evasive creature perhaps, that's difficult for the opponent to block, so we can keep venturing into the dungeon unopposed. And, you know, giving a creature plus one plus one can maybe make it easier to get in on the ground as well. So Delver's Torch, tricky card to evaluate. Um, but probably going to be at its best in, of course, the black-white and blue-white archetypes, specifically blue-white, I think, because that's where we will have the highest density of evasive creatures to put the Delver's Torch on. So there's uh, several 1-mana, one 1-1 one -one flyers that we can potentially equip, and uh, if we can consistently venture into the dungeon, it will make it easier to complete those uh, long dungeons with uh, more stages, which also will have the bigger reward eventually. So I'll give Delver's Torch a C, but uh, probably not going to want us outside of those dedicated venture decks. Devoted Paladin, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Orc Knight, and when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain vigilance until end of turn. So 4-4 four, for four, 5, that also pumps the team, is a lot of stats. Now it doesn't necessarily synergize too well with, you know, the equipment theme that we have in red-white or the life gain theme in green-white, so it's not really a synergy card, but it does just give us good stats and uh, potentially works well if we have a way to generate some tokens to then buff up with the plus one plus one and vigilance. So this is just a good white card that you're probably happy to have in pretty much any white deck as a decently standard creature with a relevant ability. So I'll go with C plus on Devoted Paladin. It's nice to have a few beefier creatures in a white aggressive deck that usually ends up with smaller creatures. Although if you have a lot of equipment, those can potentially replace access to needing a 5 mana 4-4. Four, four. Divine Smite is a 2 mana instant add uncommon. Target creature or planeswalker an opponent control phases out. If that permanent is black, we can exile it instead. So let's say the opponent isn't playing black, then Divine Smite's pretty unexciting, just phasing out something for 2 mana. Probably not worth a card. So that probably puts this as a D 
a card that we're probably only going to consider out of the sideboard if we're facing a black deck, but a card we're not going to be happy to main deck in uh, most circumstances at least. And we will see a cycle of these hate cards that are more effective against a certain color of creatures. Divine Smite is one of the weaker ones, at least for limited. Dragon's Disciple, 2 mana for a 1-3 Human Monk at Uncommon. As it enters the battlefield, we may reveal a Dragon card from our hand. If we do, or if we control a Dragon, then the Disciple enters with a plus one plus one counter on it. So potentially a 2 mana 2-4 two if we have a Dragon, which is pretty decent, helps us play defense well. But if we don't have a Dragon, then it's just a 2 mana 1-3, which is not particularly playable. And then dragons we control have ward 1, so opponent's gonna have to pay one more mana to take out any of our dragons or potentially target them. Don't love the dragon's disciple. There is a cycle of dragons at uncommon, and there's even more at rare, but it's not like every deck is gonna have a multitude of dragons. So dragon's disciple gets a D to continue the alliteration. Dwarf Vault Champions, a 2 mana 3 1 Dwarf Warrior, and as long as it's equipped, it gets plus 0 plus 2. So, pretty decent common. Can potentially be a 3 3 if it's equipped for 2 mana, that's a good deal. And as we know, Red White cares about equipment, so most Red White decks are going to have quite a few equipment to choose from. And of course, the cheaper they are, the easier it is to get that bonus on the champion. So, yeah, champion seems like a solid filler cards and potentially goes up in value the more equipment we have so it could go up to a c plus in a very dedicated equipment deck but i'll start out with a c for dwarf Hall champion just a good two drop and every deck needs access to a few of these uh, two drops to make sure it doesn't get run over by other decks that are curving out next is flump a two mana o4 jellyfish and rare it has defender it has flying and when Flumph is dealt damage, you and target opponent each draw a card. So this will probably be at its best in a more controlling deck, so I wouldn't play this in a red-white equipment deck where you're trying to, you know, curve out and put some equipment on creatures and beat down. This is probably better suited for a, a slow blue-white deck that wants to get to the late game and then take over with its card advantage. So. If you're both drawing a card, then it's typically going to favor the deck that has the better late game and can make better use of those extra cards. You know, pretty situational card, I would say. Doesn't fit into every archetype, but it's playable in the right deck. So I'll give this a C. Gloomstalker is a 3 mana 2 3, saying as long as you've completed a dungeon, Gloomstalker has double strike, and it's a dwarf ranger. So 2-3 double strike, plays well with equipment. Completing a dungeon fits better with the uh, blue-white and black-white archetypes, whereas equipment to pair with double strike are more of a red-white thing. That being said, of course, you might still have a few equipment in your black-white or blue-white decks. So that makes this card a little bit awkward in a sense, as it has a few overlapping synergies and it's not going to be trivial to make best use of both. Although a 2-3 double strike, even outside of any equipment synergies, is still decent. So yeah, Gloomstalker's fine. Probably give this a C. Fine filler card that gets better the more aggressive you are about completing your dungeons. So probably going to be a bit better in black-white than blue-white. Then we get our first Planeswalker, a Grand Master of Flowers. 4 mana for a 3 loyalty. Bahamut Planeswalker has a very interesting passive ability saying as long as the Grandmaster has seven or more loyalty he is a 7-7 seven, seven dragon god creature with flying and indestructible. Starts out at three loyalty the first plus one ability says target creature without first strike double strike or vigilance cannot attack or block until your next turn so it does have a bit of protection built into the first plus one and then the second plus one lets you search your library and or graveyard for a card named Monk of the Open Hand to reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. And uh, as we'll see in a minute, the Monk of the Open Hand is a 1 mana 1 1 that can potentially pick up counters if we cast multiple uh, spells in the same turn, I believe. 
So if you can get the uncommon Monk of the Open Hands, then the Grandmaster goes up in value uh, significantly. Otherwise, it's just a Planeswalker that's just trying to get to 7 loyalty as quickly as possible, which may or may not work out since we only have the first plus one to really make use of. Interesting to note about the Grandmaster reaching 7 loyalty is that once it turns into a creature, the opponent can no longer attack it and decrease its loyalty, because it's no longer a Planeswalker at that point that can be attacked and its loyalty decreased. So it is going to probably win you the game if you do get to 7 loyalty, as you'll just have this 7-7 flying indestructible creature that's very difficult to interact with. Still a Planeswalker that demands respect, so I'll give this an A. An interesting card, and ideally you can get the Monk of the Open Hand to go with it. Guardian of Faith, 3 mana, 3-2, three, Spirit Knight at rare with Flash and Vigilance. And when a Guardian enters battlefield, any number of other target creatures you control phase out. So by itself a 3 mana, 3-2 three, with Vigilance is, you know, reasonable. And Flash for potentially an ambush blocker makes it a bit better. And then phasing out other creatures means that it can potentially save one of your creatures from a removal spell. So those are all small upsides that make this into a pretty decent card. Still not ecstatic about it, but a C plus for Guardian of Faith seems appropriate. Just a very solid card that can make almost all of your white decks. Next up we have Half Elf Monk. A 4 mana, 1 4 human elf monk with vigilance. And for 2 mana, we can tap the monk to tap target creature. So, tapping creatures are typically very strong and limited. They can act as removal, taking out the opponent's biggest and scariest attackers. And you can potentially tap down a creature in the opponent's turn and then tap down a second creature in your own turn to set up some good attacks. Now it is kind of expensive to tap something down for 2 mana, so we're often used to not paying anything or maybe just 1 mana to tap something down. In this case we're paying 2 mana, but we also get a 1-4 with Vigilance, so some decent stats that can also potentially chip in for a bit of damage, and a 1-4 is not that easy to take out. So I like a C plus for Half Elf Monk, definitely going to be an annoying card to face. Then we have Icing Death, Frost Tyrant, a 4 mana 4 3, a legendary dragon at Mythic with Flying and Vigilance. And when Icing Death dies, we get to make Icing Death, Frost Tongue, a legendary white equipment artifact token that says the equipped creature gets plus 2 plus 0. And whenever equipped creature attacks, tap target creature defending player controls, and the equip cost is 2. So already. By itself a 4 mana 4 3 flying vigilance is quite strong and even if the opponent somehow manages to deal with it you might be left with an equipment that's also very powerful in and of itself so icing death is uh, quite a beating and you're gonna need a very specific answer to deal with icing death we will see a couple clean answers for it but there's not many so if you don't have one, do one of those available you're gonna be in uh, a lot of trouble and 4 mana means that this is going to be on the battlefield pretty quickly and uh, not a lot of time to find an answer to it. So this seems like an S tier level card. It will take over the game if it goes unanswered and even if the opponent has an answer, under most circumstances they're still going to be pretty far behind as that uh, equipment is incredibly strong. So S for Icing Death. Ingenious Smith is up next, a 2 mana 1-1 one, one Human Artificer at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top 4 cards of your library. You may reveal an artifact card from among them and put it into your hand, and the rest goes on the bottom. And whenever one or more artifacts enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus on plus 1 counter on the Smith, and it only triggers once each turn. Now there are a decent number of artifacts in the set, mostly equipment, but still probably not enough to consistently hit something with the Enter the Battlefield ability from the Smith. And if you're not hitting anything, the creature by itself is not particularly exciting. You'll need to get at least two counters before it's really worth it. So assuming you don't consistently hit with the ETB ability and then 
the creature afterwards is kind of underwhelming, makes this overall not a card I'm excited about, even in a red-white equipment deck where you might have a few artifacts. So I'm gonna give this a D for Ingenious Smith, although might have some constructed applications. The major problem with the Smith and Treasures is that white just doesn't have a ton of treasure synergy, so even though treasures can potentially grow it, you're not going to find a ton of treasure synergy in white to begin with. And uh, yeah, still don't think it's particularly great. Keen-Eared Sentry is up next, a 2-mana two 2-1 two Human Soldier. At Uncommon, says you have Hexproof, and each opponent cannot venture into the dungeon more than once each turn. Just a random upside giving you Hexproof, and... Uh, stopping potential venture shenanigans. So, you know, as far as two drops go, this isn't a bad one, but, you know, it's also not a card I'm gonna pick incredibly highly, so probably lands on a C for Keen-Eared Sentry, just a fine two-mana filler creature in white. Next is Loyal Warhound, two mana for a 3-1 dog at rare, it has Vigilance, and when the Warhound enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you get to search your library for a basic planes and put it on the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. So reminiscent of Knight of the White Orchid. So typically the play pattern with the Warhound, it does get better if you're on the draw compared to the play, as then the opponent's more likely to have extra lands in play. You want to play this, let's say, on turn 3 before playing your land drop, and then you get to ramp and add a 3-1 Vigilance to the board. So not a card you necessarily want to play on turn 2. But uh, yeah, the Warhound's great, can provide some nice value, and then a 3-1 Vigilance can usually trade off for the opponent's 2 or 3 drop. So a nice 2 for 1 under most circumstances. So we'll give Warhound a B. Minimus Containment is the removal spell that white gets access to, a 3-mana enchantment aura that enchants a non-land permanent, and then the enchanted permanent turns into a treasure artifact that can be tapped and sacrificed to add one mana of any color, and it also loses its author abilities. So turning an opposing, let's say, creature into a treasure is potentially a way to answer it, but you don't really want to be using containment in the early turns, because ramping the opponent into even bigger and scarier creatures is not where you typically want to be. But assuming the opponent has cast their biggest and scariest card already, and they're empty-handed or close to empty-handed, then it's probably not a bad answer for some scary dragon, for instance, that the opponent might have. So I'm not super high on Minimus Containment, Kind of reminds me a bit of Divine Gambit in the sense that you don't want to be using this early on. But, you know, if you're really desperate, you can always go for it and uh, hope that the opponent doesn't use that treasure to their advantage too much. So I think C plus is where I land on Minimus Containment. It's one of the better removal spells that White has to offer, which uh, kind of says a lot about the quality of White's removal overall. Next we have Monk of the Open Hand. This is a card that pairs with our white Planeswalker. 1 mana, 1-1 one, one at Uncommon. And says whenever we cast our second spell each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the Monk. So casting two spells in the same turn, as we've learned from the uh, mechanic in Kaltheim, isn't trivial. You might be able to enable this maybe once or twice, but consistently casting two spells in the same turn is not going to happen. So I wouldn't overvalue Monk of the Open Hand. If you can maybe hold this and then cast this alongside another, let's say, two or three drop and get a plus one counter on it right away, that's maybe a way to kind of kickstart those additional counters. But then you also kind of lost the upside of this being a one drop. So I'm gonna give Monk a D, but if you get the Planeswalker, of course, this card goes up in value drastically. And uh, if you get the Planeswalker, I would be very happy to have at least one Monk in my deck. Next is Moonblast Cleric, 3 mana for a 3-2 Human Elf Cleric at Uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for an enchantment card, reveal it, and then put it on top after shuffling. 
So Moonblast Cleric can potentially find one of our removal spells if it's that enchantment aura. But there's a few other enchantments that might be worth searching up as well. So assuming you have a decent selection of enchantments to search up, then Moonblast Cleric can be a pretty nice uh, card as well. So I think I'm going to go with a C plus on the Cleric. It's a good card, assuming you have those enchantments to go with it. Of course, without any enchantments, this is not a card I would consider. Nadar, Selfless Paladin, is a 3-mana, three 3-3 three, three Legendary Dragon Knight with Vigilance. And when Nadar enters a battlefield or attacks, we can venture into the dungeon. And then once we complete our first dungeon, author creatures we control get plus one plus one. So this card seems great. Uh, can come down. 3-3 three, three Vigilance for 3 is uh, at least as large or larger than whatever the opponent has going on in the early game. So can potentially attack once or twice and uh, get you going on completing that first dungeon. And uh, yeah, the fact that it has an entered battlefield ability that ventures means we get immediate value even if the opponent answers it right away. So there's a lot to like about Nadar and I think I'm willing to give this an A. Just an excellent card for any deck that cares about completing dungeons or just venturing in dungeons in general. Then we have Oswald's Fiddlebender, a 2-mana, two 2-2 two -two legendary gnome artificer at rare. And we can pay a white mana, tap it, and sacrifice an artifact to search our library for an artifact with mana value equal to 1 plus the sacrificed artifact's mana value and put it onto the battlefield. So kind of a birthing pod for artifacts. As we mentioned, there are a few artifacts in the set, but there's very few artifacts that we're happy to sacrifice, really. Uh, in white, there's one that comes to mind that we'll get to in a second. But uh, we're mostly kind of looking to maybe upgrade some of our equipment. Maybe uh, we've got some cheaper equipment that are no longer relevant in the late game, and we can potentially upgrade them with Fiddlebender into a slightly more powerful artifact. But for the most part, we kind of want to evaluate this as a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with slight upside. So 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with slight upside probably gets a C+, assuming we have at least one or two artifacts we can upgrade. Otherwise, this is probably closer to a D. But uh, yeah, in most white decks, we're going to end up with at least one or two equipments. And if those have mana values that uh, follow each other up, then... Fiddlebender could potentially make use of its ability. Then we have Paladin class, a 1-mana enchantment class at rare, saying spells your opponents cast during your turn cost 1 generic mana more to cast, so it can punish instant speed plays from our opponent. Then level 2 for 3 mana says creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1, so typically there's not many things you're going to be doing on turn 1, so Perfect time to cast your Paladin class. And then 3 mana to get an Anthem effect is pretty much what we're used to paying in Limited. 3 mana to give your creatures plus 1 plus 1 permanently. And that's already a very good card in Limited. And then there's even more. Level 3 for 5 mana says whenever you attack, until end of turn, target attacking creature gets plus 1 plus 1 for each other attacking creature and gains double strike. So that's a lot of extra power and potential damage output that we get from our Paladin class. So yeah, Paladin class has a lot going for it, and I think it totals to a nice A bomb level card that's uh, pretty difficult to ignore if you're the opponent. Paladin's Shield is next, a 2-mana artifact equipment with flash, so we can play it at instant speed, and when it enters the battlefield we can attach it to target creature we control, giving it two additional toughness. And then if we want to move it afterwards, we have to pay three mana. So it kind of acts as a bit of a combo trick by boosting someone's toughness. And then we still have an equipment afterwards that we can potentially make use of. Not the most exciting equipment. So probably give this closer to a C, maybe even a D. It's like a, a low C. I think I prefer the plus two mace over this. In a deck that has some equipment synergy, 
uh, this might go up in value and it's still nice to have that mana sink and additional toughness can always come in handy. Next is Planar Ally, 5 mana for a 3-3 Angel at common. It flies as angels do and when it attacks we can venture into the dungeon. So this is easily a, a repeatable way to venture into the dungeon if the opponent doesn't have any evasive blockers or ways to take out uh, ally. So yeah, the planar ally pretty much requires an answer immediately, otherwise it's going to get out of hand very quickly. Great in any black-white or blue-white decks. And I think this is going to end up being the uh, best white common in the set. So B for planar ally. Seems great. Plate armor is a 3-mana artifact equipment at uncommon, giving the equipped creature plus 3 plus a 3 and ward 1. So that's a lot of extra power and toughness for a 3-mana equipment. The equip cost is kind of steep at 3 mana, but it costs 1 generic mana less to activate for each other equipment we control. So there's always a bit of a risk when we're playing too many equipment that we end up with all equipment and no creatures in any given hand. But you know, assuming a healthy amount of equipment and creatures, and ideally you don't have too many other non-creature spells in your deck to make sure that you always have something to equip, then if we can maybe have one author equipment alongside plate armor, this only costs two mana to equip, then it's a lot more reasonable. And yeah, as we've said, a lot of power and toughness for a three mana equipment. So I think plate armor's pretty great, and uh, especially if you have at least one author equipment to make it cheaper to move it around, it's gonna be even better. So I think a B for plate armor, a bit of a build around in the sense that you want a few author equipment to go alongside it, but uh, don't fall into the trap of playing too many equipment because then there's always that risk as well. Portable Hole is a one mana artifact at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls with mana value two or less until the hole leaves the battlefield. So only takes care of small stuff, although it can also take care of some creature tokens, not that there's many token makers in the set. It's very efficient at one mana, but most cards we care about in limited are going to cost more than two mana. Now it does take care of any non-land permanents, so it can also potentially get rid of an equipment. So, you know, it's uh, a card that's usually going to have a target on the other side of the battlefield. Being an artifact has its advantages and disadvantages. So overall, probably you land on a C plus for a portable hole, a card I'm pretty happy to have in most decks, uh, as it can also potentially answer the class enchantments, which often end up costing one or two mana. So C plus for a portable hole. Potion of Healing is next a two mana artifact that when it enters a battlefield draws a card and we can pay a white mana, tap it, and sacrifice it to gain three life. So it's easy to compare this to Revitalize, which costs one fewer mana to essentially get the same effect. But the upside here is that Potion of Healing is an artifact we can potentially use for author synergies. We can, for instance, sacrifice it to our uh, Fiddlebender to potentially get a three mana artifact. That's one synergy. As we'll see in a second, there's also Teleportation Circle at 4 mana, a rare that lets you blink creatures or artifacts, which can potentially help us draw an extra card each turn. So there's a few of those synergies uh, present in the set that make Potion of Healing better than it would be otherwise. And then it's also a way to gain 3 life to potentially enable some life gain synergies. So if your deck doesn't have any synergy with Potion of Healing whatsoever, then you can easily go without it. But it's not difficult to find at least one or two good synergies with Potion of Healing, and at the end of the day it's a card that replaces itself for two mana. So it's not bad. Still probably not more than a C, but I can imagine some decks being very happy to have multiple of these. 
Priest of Ancient Lore is a 3 mana 2 1 dwarf cleric that when it enters a battlefield it gains one life and draws a card. So it enables life gain synergies and as a 3 mana 2 1 that replaces itself by drawing a card, there's not much that uh, keeps you from including this in pretty much any white deck. So this is excellent, easily a C. Might even sneak its way into the B category if it turns out that the life gain synergy is uh, worth enough. But uh, yeah, pretty much a, a card you're going to include in every white deck, in limited at least. Rally Maneuver is a 3 mana instant at uncommon, saying target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 and gains first strike until end of turn. And up to one author target creature gets plus O plus two and gains life link until end of turn. So this can easily be a two for one and a complete blowout in the middle of combat if you can pick your spot. Now there will also be situations where this is kind of just stranded in your hands and it doesn't line up favorably. And as far as combat tricks go, three mana is pretty expensive. So I'm still not super high on rally maneuver, but I do definitely uh, see its potential and we'll give Rally Maneuver a C. Ranger's Hawk, 1 mana for a 1-1 bird at common, it flies and for 3 mana we can tap it and tap another untapped creature we control to venture into the dungeon, can only be used at sorcery speed. So Ranger's Hawk has a few things going for it. First off we've learned not to underestimate these 1 mana flyers since they usually turn out to be better than they look. Uh, another thing the Ranger's Hawk has going for it is that it's in white, which is a color that has a ton of equipment and various equipment synergies, and putting equipment that increase the Ranger's Hawk's power can potentially turn it into a pretty quick clock that can end the game in a few attacks. And on top of that we can also potentially use it as a mana sink, let's say the opponent does have a flying blocker or reach creature, then we can still make use of the Ranger's Hawk to progress our game plan. So yeah, overall I'm liking Ranger's Hawk quite a bit and I think we land on C plus for it overall. Now it is true that most of the equipment synergies are in red-white and that's maybe not the color that cares the most about venturing into the dungeon. So it may not be at its best in any particular color pair, but you know, assuming you've got a white deck that cares a little bit about venturing and has a few equipment, that's probably the sweet spot for the Ranger's Hawk. Steadfast Paladin is next to 2 mana 2 2 Dwarf Knight with lifelink. And yeah, this is a common we've seen in a few different forms in a lot of sets now, and it's always a card that ends up overperforming, especially in a set with equipment. And yeah, any equipment put on a lifelink creature is going to make it even better. So I like C plus for Standfast Paladin. Definitely a card you want to be on the lookout for if you're trying to draft an equipment deck. Teleportation Circle is a card I've uh, referenced a second ago when talking about the healing artifact. So 4 mana enchantment at rare, saying at the beginning of your end step, exile up to one target artifact or creature you control and return it to the battlefield right away. So this can essentially flicker one of our artifacts or creatures. And we've seen quite a few beneficial enter battlefield abilities so far. A great with a dwarf that gains one life and draws a card. A great with pretty much any effect that draws a card. We've got a lot of creatures that can venture into the dungeon when they enter a battlefield. So assuming you've got a high density of those creatures and artifacts. Teleportation Circle seems great. Now it does have the risk of you sometimes not drawing any of those cards to synergize with the circle and then it just ends up being this four man enchantment that doesn't do anything. But it can even potentially save a creature that's enchanted by a removal spell uh, like the white one that turns it into a treasure or potentially the blue one that keeps it tamped down. So that's another use of flickering your creature. So overall, I like Teleportation Circle quite a bit. Gonna be somewhat conservative and still give it a B, but there's gonna be decks that this will easily be an A that uh, completely takes over the game. 
Veteran Dungeoneer is a 4 mana 3 4 and common. It's a human warrior that when it enters the battlefield lets you venture into the dungeon. So just a great common with decent stats and that will help out any deck trying to venture into dungeons. So C plus for Veteran Dungeoneer, nothing bad to say about it. White Dragon is our first uncommon dragon and there's an entire cycle of these in each color. This one's a 6 mana 4-4 four, four with flying and when it enters the battlefield we can tap target creature and opponent controls and it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Yeah, this is a B, just a powerful evasive creature that will eventually end the game if the opponent doesn't answer it. And then a nice enter battlefield ability that we can also potentially abuse with our 4 mana enchantment and uh, just makes it easier to win the race by keeping the opponent's largest creature tapped down. You hear something on watch, a 2 mana instant that lets you choose one. You can arouse the party, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn, or you can set off the traps and deal 5 damage to target attacking creature. So dealing damage to attacking creatures means this will be at its best in a more defensive deck, as opposed to a very aggressive deck that typically keeps the opponent on the back foot. But then again, if you're an aggressive deck, you can maybe make use of the plus one plus one to the team. And uh, if you're a more controlling deck, you're mostly going to be using the five damage, but every now and then the plus one plus one still comes in handy. So it's a nice mix of abilities, which makes this almost never a dead card. I think this still lands on a C, just because it is a little awkward in a more aggressive deck and why it tends to be more aggressive. But in a more controlling, maybe blue-white deck, I could see this going up to a C+. You're ambushed on the road, one mana instant at common. And you can either make a retreat and return target creature you control to its owner's hand, or you can stand and fight and then target creature gets plus one plus three until end of turn. None of these two modes are particularly powerful or impactful. So this is probably not going to be worth a card. So I land on a D for your ambushed on the road. Time to take a look at blue. Our first card is a Burnt Mind Sorcerer. A 5 mana 3 for human elf shaman that when it enters the battlefield we choose target instant or sorcery card in our graveyard and then roll a D20. 20 sided dice. And if the final result is between a 1 and a 9, we may put that card on top of our library. If it's between a 10 or a 20, we return that card to our hand. So 5 mana, 3, 4, and uncommon that can potentially get a card back into our hands. It's slightly more likely to put it into our hand than on top of our deck. And if it does put it into our hands, it is pretty strong. 3, 4 that essentially draws the best card in our graveyard. At least uh, that's an instant or sorcery. If it doesn't put it into our hand and it goes on top of our deck, it's still reasonable, but it does get a lot less exciting. Now, do keep in mind, rolling dice has a couple synergies in blue, especially blue-red, and there are cards that can potentially increase our odds when it comes to rolling dice, or cards that will have some other benefit whenever we roll a dice. So have to factor that in as well. So overall, I think C plus is fair for the Mind Sorcerer. A decent card that isn't always going to be perfect if you get between 1 and 9. But uh, whenever you get double digits, you're going to be quite happy with it. Air Cult Elemental is a 6 mana 2 5 elemental. At common, it flies. And when it enters the battlefield, return up to one author target creature to its owner's hand. So the classic mana war effect stapled onto a 2 5 flyer. Now it is kind of pricey at 6 mana, but it's still incredibly impactful and will usually stabilize the board whenever you play it. 2 5 can hold off most flyers. Now it doesn't profitably block the 3 3 flyer that ventures whenever it attacks, so you'll need some other flyers to take that out. Yeah, I'm still pretty high on Aircult Elemental. 
probably fall somewhere between a C plus and a B minus. Um, I'll start out with a C plus on Aircult Elemental, but uh, this could easily move up all the way to a B if it ends up performing. Something else to keep in mind is that bounce effects are incredibly powerful against any creatures equipped with uh, equipment, since you're not only bouncing the creature, but you're also making the opponent repay any costs when it comes to moving their equipment around. So that's also important to keep in mind when evaluating bounce spells. Now a 2-5 doesn't end the game very quickly, but it does block pretty well. So yeah, I think a C plus on the high end of C plus is fair for the elemental. Arcane Investigator is a 2 mana 2-1 two at common. It's an elf wizard, and for 6 mana we can roll a d20, and if we get between 1 and 9 we get to draw a card, and 10 or 20 we get to look at the top 3 cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, rest on the bottom. So a 2-1 for 2, that can be played early to trade off if needed, and that has a relevant late game ability, it's kind of whatever, it's kind of perfect when it comes to 2 drops. That's the major downside of two drops is when you get to the late game and they're not very relevant anymore. But Arcane Investigator is definitely still going to be doing a lot of work for you in the late game. So yeah, uh, there's a lot to like about it. Still pretty expensive to activate the ability. So it's not like you're going to be able to use this multiple times in the same turn. So probably still just a C for Arcane Investigator but I'm pretty happy to have one of these in my blue decks, especially if I'm light on other 2-mana cards. Bar the Gates is a 3-mana instant at common that counters target creature or planeswalker spell, and then we can venture into the dungeon as well. This is a pretty efficient counter spell in the sense that it doesn't require double blue to cast it, which is often what makes those 3-mana counters awkward and limited. It is still 3 mana, so not every deck is going to be able to make use of this. Ideally you have some other instant you can play alongside it, or activated ability you can use. So I imagine this will be at its best in uh, blue-green, that's the color pair that has other instant speed abilities it can use, thinking about the uncommon for instance. But it also pairs well of course with venturing into the dungeon, so blue-white is another great home for this. So I think C plus for Bardigate, as opposed to the usual grade I give these. The Black Staff of Waterdeep is a 1 mana legendary artifact or rare, and you may choose not to untap it during your untap step, and for 2 mana we can tap it to turn one of our non-token artifacts into a 4-4 artifact creature for as long as the staff stays tapped. So we cannot animate our treasure tokens, which are probably the most plentiful uh, artifacts we're going to see in play. But it can potentially turn, let's say that uh, Potion of Healing in white can be turned into a 4-4 creature, so that's pretty good value. So that's kind of where this card is going to be at its best. And uh, can also turn our equipment into creatures potentially. And a 4-4 is not small, especially in blue, which usually doesn't get very large creatures. So it's a bit of a, a build around. It's not going to be great in every blue deck, um, but the payoff is potentially there. So probably C plus for Black Staff. Uh, difficult card to evaluate for sure, and you're going to have to kind of evaluate it for yourself whenever you're including this in any deck. Blue Dragon is a 7 mana Uncommon Dragon. It's a 5-5, it flies, and when it enters the battlefield, until your next turn, target creature an opponent controls gets minus 3 minus 0, another minus 2 minus 0, and another minus 1 minus 0, until your next turn. So, yeah, shrinks a lot of stuff down. 7 mana is expensive, but we do get a 5-5, so doesn't mess around. Bigger than some of the other dragons out there and uh, pretty much shrinks down the opponent's entire team for a couple turns. So yeah, Blue Dragon, also worthy of a B. I think most of these uncommon dragons are going to fall into the 
B range just because of how impactful they are and their potential to close out the game, even if this one's a bit on the pricey side. Charmed Sleep, 3 mana, Enchantment Aura. And when it enters the battlefield, we tap the enchanted creature, and the enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So this is about as good as it gets for blue removal. And in particular, in this expansion, Charm Sleep is going to be better than it would be elsewhere, because there's a lot of creatures that somehow come back when they get killed, come back from the graveyard, and uh, if you don't have an exile-based removal spell or something like Charm Sleep to take care of them, you're still going to be in trouble. So not too many main deckable enchantment removal spells in the set. The uh, white two-drop is kind of the exception. I think there's another one in green as well, but not that many. It's mostly cards that answer artifacts. So your Charm Sleep should be relatively safe. And as I've mentioned, going to be a great answer to not only those large dragons, but some of the other powerful rares and mythics you're going to come across. So overall, I would usually give Charm Sleep closer to a C+. I think in this set specifically, it's going to overperform, and I'm willing to give this a B. Clever Conjurer is a 3-mana 2-3, Gnome Wizard. It can tap to untap target permanent, not named Clever Conjurer, can only be used at sorcery speed. So Conjurer can help us ramp by untapping our lands. It can give our creatures pseudo vigilance by untapping them after attacking. So it does a lot of useful things. And overall, happy giving this a C+. Not quite a Kelpie guide, but uh, can definitely have some useful abilities. Can also potentially free a creature that's underneath an opposing charm sleep and still attack with it although you'll have to untap it again and again. Contact Other Plane, 4 mana instant at common, and we roll a d20. Between 1 and 9 we get to draw 2, 10 and 19 we get to scry 2 and then draw 2, and if we roll a natural 20 we get to scry 3 and then draw 3 cards. So in most circumstances we can kind of take the average here and say that this is going to about scry one and then draw two. So that's kind of the, the shorthand to evaluate this. But it also rolls a d20, so it has additional dice rolling synergies potentially. So yeah, Contact Author Plane is going to be a pretty great card draw spell for any blue deck, and you're going to be happy with the first copy at least. Just going to be careful not to have too many card draw effects without impacting the board, but a few of these will go a long way. So C plus for contact author plane. Next is Demilich, four mana for a four three skeleton wizard at mythic rare. Now when I say four mana, it's four blue mana. So pretty difficult spell to cast in most blue decks unless you're somehow mono blue. But it costs a blue mana less to cast for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. And whenever Demolich attacks, you can exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, copy it, and cast a copy. And we can also cast Demolich from our graveyard by exiling four instant and or sorcery cards from our graveyard in addition to paying its other costs. Now it doesn't have any evasive abilities, it's just a 4-3. But if we can maybe replay some bound spells out of the graveyard, then uh, we can potentially clear a path for it. And there are instances where we could potentially cast it for free, although that's not going to come up very often. So, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Demolich just because of the prohibitive casting cost being quadruple blue. I wouldn't recommend first picking this and then forcing a mono blue deck. I don't think that's going to work out most of the time. So I think this falls somewhere in the C category where, you know, sometimes if you're a two-color deck with a bit of mana fixing, maybe from treasures or you're just a heavy blue deck with maybe a splash, you can cast this around turn 5 or 6, and then maybe it gets a bit of value. I don't think uh, you're going to be able to cast this out of the graveyard too often. Next is Displacer Beast, 3 mana for a 3-2 canned beast out in common. When it enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. So already pretty good. 
And then for four mana, we can return the beast to its owner's hand. So we can potentially block with the beast and then bounce it back to our hand. And that way prevent some damage. And of course, by putting it back in our hand, we can also replay it to venture into the dungeon again. So there's a lot to like about Displacer Beast. And uh, overall gets a C plus from me. Very solid card. Ginny Windseer, 4 mana for a 3-3 Jin at common. It flies. When it enters, we roll a d20. And we either scry 1, scry 2, or scry 3 if we hit the natural 20. So Windseer, pretty decent card. 3-3 three, three flyer for 4. Always great and limited. And here we even get to scry a bunch. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. I think this is going to be one of the better commons in blue. And gets a B alongside Charmed Sleep. A Dragon Turtle is a 3 mana 3-5 three at rare. It has flash, but when it enters the battlefield we have to tap it and up to one other target creature and opponent controls and they don't untap during their controller's next untap steps. So it's not going to ambush anything unless we can somehow untap this, which is probably not going to happen. Um, but it does potentially tap down the opponent's largest attacker in the opponent's beginning of combat phase. So it can essentially take a creature out of commission for two entire turns, as we can prevent the attack the turn we play the turtle, and then it's not going to untap in the next turn, so can definitely buy us a lot of time. And at the same time we also get a 3-5 for 3 mana, which is a lot of stats. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Dragon Turtle. Maybe it doesn't quite do what you want it to do the turn you play it, as it's not going to ambush anything, but you're still getting a pretty good deal and a lot of power and toughness. So B for Dragon Turtle. Eccentric Apprentice is a 3 mana 2-2 two, two Tiefling Wizard at Uncommon. It has flying, and when it enters a battlefield you can venture into the dungeon. Always a nice enter battlefield ability. But there's more at the beginning of combat on your turn. If you've completed a dungeon, up to one target creature becomes a bird with base, power and toughness 1-1 one, one, and flying until end of turn. So we can both use this to shrink down an opposing creature into a 1-1 one, one bird, or potentially if the opponent doesn't have any flying blockers or reach creatures. We can turn off our ground creatures into a 1-1 one, one, one flyer to potentially get in a bit of extra damage. So a very versatile card, and all for just 3 mana, and a nice enter a battlefield ability on top. So there's a lot to like about the Apprentice. Um, do we go all the way up to a B, or is this closer to a C plus? I think I'm willing to give this a B, especially for a deck that... Um, cares about completing dungeons or venturing in general. If your deck doesn't have a ton of venture synergy, this is going to be probably closer to a C, C+. But uh, yeah, B for Apprentice. Feywild Trickster is a 3 mana 2-2, two, two, no Morlock at Uncommon. Says whenever you roll one or more dice, create a 1-1 one, one blue fairy dragon creature token with flying. So this is quite a payoff for rolling dice. A 1-1 one, one token is okay, but a 1-1 one, one token with flying is close to worth a card. So getting one of those for each time we roll a dice is going to get out of hand very quickly. And there's a lot of cards at common even that let you roll dice in blue. In red there's also quite a few. So yeah, Trickster seems like one of the better build around on commons. This easily gets a B. In the right deck, this will take over a game. Next is Fly, a 1 mana enchantment aura at uncommon enchants a creature. And the enchanted creature has flying, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we can venture into the dungeon. So normally, I wouldn't be very high on an enchantment like Fly. After looking at the entire set, I've kind of changed my opinion on it a little bit, as it not only gives us an evasive ability in a set that is kind of uh, board stally at times, I think, um, since evasive creatures are often going to decide the outcome of a game, um, but then it also synergizes very well 
with not only the venture mechanic, but also with the blue-black deck that has a lot of creatures that give you a benefit whenever they hit the opponent that Fly can enable by giving creatures flying. So overall, I think Fly gets a C+, where it would otherwise not really be a consideration outside of maybe hexproof synergies, which there aren't in this set. So C+, for Fly, nice enabler for a lot of various synergies. A Grazilax Illithid Scholar is a 3-mana 3-2 three legendary horror at rare, and says whenever a creature control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. So that's already a pretty interesting ability, means you can potentially attack with a team, and there's not going to be any profitable blocks for the opponents, since you can always just bounce your creature back and replay it. Great with any Enter the Battlefield abilities. And then, whenever one or more creatures you control deal comma damage to a player, you can draw a card. Now, do keep in mind this is different from Toski from Call Time that lets you draw a card for each creature that deals damage. You'll only get to draw one card at most, even if multiple creatures connect. But it's pretty easy to connect with the first ability, as you can always just bounce some creatures back to your hand. So Grasselax still definitely going to be at its best if you've got some evasive creatures that you can keep getting in with turn after turn. So small flyers, creatures that can become unblockable are going to be great. But even if you don't, you can still potentially make use of the card draw effect by bouncing creatures that get uh, blocked by the opponent. So yeah, I think I go all the way up to an A for Grasselax, a bomb that will take over a game if unanswered. And a 3-mana three 3-2 three is also not a terribly standard creature by itself. Guild Thief is a 2-mana 1-1 one one Orc Rogue at Uncommon. Since when it deals combat damage to a player, we can put a plus one plus one counter on it. So another incentive to hit the opponent works well in the blue-black rogue kind of guild class. And for four mana, the guild thief cannot be blocked this turn. So kind of expensive at four mana, but it is a great mana sink to take over any board stall, as the first time it's gonna hit the opponent, grow up to a 2-2, and that can easily snowball and turn into a bigger and bigger creature. There's also kind of the threat of the Guild Thief connecting in the first place. So if you play this on turn two, the opponent's going to be forced into kind of a defensive stance from the start of the game. Yeah, even though it might not be very large at first, it's going to be a headache for the opponent. So at the very least a C plus for Guild Thief. Although there will be times that this can overperform and kind of win a game by itself. Next is our legendary Mythic Rare Dragon in blue. Imrith Desert Doom, 5 mana for a 5 5 flying dragon. It has a ward 4 as long as it's untapped, so it makes it almost impossible for the opponent to take it out as long as it's untapped. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you get to draw a card. And then if you have fewer than three cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference. So if you're empty-handed, you're going to get to draw three cards if this hits. So 5 mana 5-5 five, five flyer that's almost impossible to kill if it's untapped means that it's very likely to connect with the opponent, as they're unlikely to have creatures able to block this profitably, and then draws a ton of cards when it does connect. Yeah, this card's pretty insane and gets an S rating. Very difficult for the opponent to interact with and guarantees at least a little bit of value before the opponent even has a chance to answer it. Mind Flayer is a 5 mana 3-3 three, three rare. It's a horror and when Mind Flayer enters the battlefield you gain control of target creature for as long as we control Mind Flayer. So another great card. There's not a ton of removal in the set, and some removal spells also don't necessarily take out the Mind Flayer. Thinking about Charmed Sleep can keep this tab down, but doesn't really remove it from play, so we're still gonna gain control of the stolen creature. So Mind Flayer is an easy A. Steals the opponent biggest creature and demands an immediate answer, otherwise that creature is gonna take over the game. Next is our blue planeswalker, 
Mordenkainen, a six mana, five loyalty, legendary Mordenkainen planeswalker. The plus two lets us draw two and then put a card from our hand on the bottom of our library. So not quite a draw two, but it does give us a bit of selection in addition to just drawing a card. Then the minus two makes a dog illusion creature token with power and toughness each equal to twice the number of cards in our hand. So it doesn't take many cards for that token to be relevant. And the plus two of course fuels the token as well. And then the minus 10, if we can ever get to it, lets us exchange control of our hand and library. And we have no maximum hand size. We're probably gonna be mostly using the plus two and minus two abilities. And uh, yeah, this card definitely delivers. It is a bit weak to evasive creatures, doesn't really protect itself against those too much, but on a stalled board this will easily win you the game and give you both card advantage and a board presence. So I think A for Mordenkainen is fair. Then we've got Mordenkainen's Polymorph, a lot less exciting than the Planeswalker itself, a 2 mana instant, saying until end of turn, target creature becomes a dragon with base power and toughness 4-4 four, four, and gains flying. Not a huge fan of effects like these. It's only until end of turn, so it can maybe ambush a creature with it, but yeah, this is not really a card I'm interested in, including most of my blue decks. So I'll give this a D. Pixie Guide is a 2 mana 1 3 fairy with flying at common. It says if we would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. So great in any dice rolling synergy deck. And yeah, there's definitely a few cards we've seen so far where getting a double digit number is a pretty big reward as opposed to not doing so. And a 1-3 flyer, as opposed to a regular 1-3 for 2 mana, is actually pretty decent, so even without the dice rolling synergy, it's not a terrible card. So overall that makes this a pretty solid package, and a card you're pretty excited to have in your blue decks, since most blue decks are going to have a few dice rolling cards. So C plus for Pixie Guide. Power of Persuasion, a 3 mana sorcery and uncommon. Let's use Let's us choose target creature and opponent controls and then roll a d20. If we get between 1 and 9, return it to its owner's hand. Between 10 and 19, put it on top of the owner's library or bottom. The opponent can choose, I guess. And then if we roll a natural 20, we gain control of it until the end of our next turn. So we will get a chance to attack with it at least once. Now, I could easily see situations where we would rather hit between 10 and 19 than a 20, because uh, we would rather have the opponent replay whatever creature it is. But uh, yeah, I can also see situations where getting one attack in with a stolen creature can win us the game. Bounce spells can be nice in a set full of equipment, as we mentioned. So C for Power of Persuasion. Not necessarily a card I'm gonna include in every blue deck, but it has its place. A Ray of Frost is a 2 mana uncommon enchantment aura with flash, so we can play that instant speed. Enchants a creature, and when a Ray of Frost enters the battlefield, if the enchanted creature is red, we get to tap it. So this is part of that hate cycle that is more effective against certain colors. And as long as the enchanted creature is red, it also loses all its abilities and the enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step, regardless of it being red or not. It's definitely worse than the Charmed Sleep in most circumstances. Against the red deck specifically, of course, it's going to be amazing. Uh, but unlike the white hate cards, this is actually still okay if we're not up against the red deck. Probably gonna need to take at least one hit from whatever creature that's bothering us before we can keep it tamped down. But at least it's an answer that will permanently deal with that creature. Not as high as Charmed Sleep, since it's not as versatile. Cannot get rid of a blocker with this unless it's red. And gonna need to take at least one hit from the problematic creature, which could make the difference between winning and losing. But uh, still at least worthy of a C. And then, of course, if you're up against a red deck, this goes up in value dramatically. 
Then Rhyme Shields, Frost Giant is a 5 mana, 4 5 Giant Warrior at common. It has Ward 3. And uh, yeah, that's it. Just a big, beefy creature that's kind of difficult for the opponent to remove, so it's not as easy to get punished by some spot removal spells. And uh, we'll protect our life total nicely, maybe good in a blue eyed flyers deck that wants to be attacking in the air and then holding the fort on the ground. Still not an exciting card, but a fine curve filler. So I think this is kind of the definition of a C. Fine card. Sign of Stygia is a 3 mana 2 1 Tiefling Shaman at common with flash. So we can play it at instant speed during the opponent's turn as well. And when it enters, we can choose target creature and opponent controls, then roll a d20 between 1 and 9. We tap that creature. So probably want to play this at the beginning of combat. And if we get between 10 and 20, we tap that creature. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So pretty big difference in power level between 1 and 9 and 10 and 20. If you have dice rolling synergies, this will get a bit better. Um, so for the most part, this is going to be, I guess, on a similar power level to Frost Links, since we can play this at instant speed. So it can still keep a creature tap down, although there will be situations where it's worse than a Frost Links, since you cannot enable a good attack and prevent an attack on the way back. So yeah, probably just a C for the Scion, uh, but will be a little bit better in any deck with dice rolling synergies. Secret Door is a 1 mana 04 wall. It's an artifact creature. And of course, walls have defenders, so cannot attack. And for 5 mana, we can venture into the dungeon, but can only be used at sorcery speed. That's actually a pretty big drawback, since it means we cannot keep up counter spells and the ability or author instant speed interaction. That being said, it's a nice early blocker, so good for any slow controlling deck that cares about venturing. So blue-white is probably where this shines and then eventually turns into a nice mana sink to complete dungeons. It's kind of a narrow card, but if your blue-white venture deck doesn't have many early plays, you're going to be pretty happy with at least one secret door as both an early way to protect your life total and a late game mana sink. So probably a C for secret door, but definitely has diminishing returns. Shocking Grasp, a 2 mana instant at common, giving target creature minus 2 minus 0 until end of turn, and we get to draw a card. So not as powerful as Befuddle, but it is one cheaper, and yeah, this can easily be a, a nice 2 for 1, can shrink down a creature, let you win the fight, and you get to draw a card. So very cheap to keep up as well at instant speed, unlike Befuddle, which costs 3 mana. So, yeah, there's a lot to like about Shocking Grasp, and this will be one of the key cards to play around whenever your blue opponent keeps up their mana. So, yeah, I think C plus even for Shocking Grasp, although this might go down in value as the format progresses and people learn to play around it, similar to the uh, two mana instant from Strixhaven. Shortcut Seeker is four mana for a 2 5 human rogue at common. And when it deals combat damage to a player, we can venture into the dungeon. So there's a few cards in blue that reward us for hitting the opponent. Most of them are cheaper than the Seeker, and most of them also have a bigger payoff than the Shortcut Seeker. 2-5 is a pretty good defensive creature, so it's a bit at odds with wanting to get in the red zone. So I'm not a huge fan of uh, this card in general, just because it's trying to do two different things, in a sense, and it's not doing any of them particularly well. So I think this falls in the D range, where I'm probably not going to end up including this very often. Silver Raven is a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one bird with flying. When it enters the battlefield, we can scry 1. 
So I was pretty high on the 1-1 flyer in white. This one isn't in white, so you're not going to have as many artifacts and equipment synergies um, as you do in blue. So that makes this a lot worse. Now it is also an artifact creature, so there's potentially some artifact synergies, but probably not that many. I guess it has an ETB effect in case you get the portal to flicker it, but yeah, I don't think Silver Raven is gonna end up making the cut very often. Uh, maybe in some sort of aggressive blue-black rogue deck where you wanna have creatures that can easily connect with the opponents. This goes up in value, but overall this is probably closer to a D whereas I was pretty high on the white one-drop flyer. Soul Knife Spy, 3 mana, 3 2, when deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So very nice elf rogue at common that exemplifies what blue-black is all about. Sneaky rogues trying to hit the opponents for incremental gain. And yeah, drawing a card is a pretty big deal. There's a few ways to make this into an evasive creature, either by putting that enchantment on it to give it flying, there's the blue-black uncommon that can make it unblockable for two mana. So overall C plus for the Soul Knife Spy will require the opponent to keep back blockers at almost any time, and then if you do have some ways to make it unblockable or give it flying, it will go up in value even more. Split the party is next to 5 mana source rate uncommon. You choose target player and return half of the creatures they control to their owner's hand. Round it up. So it can potentially bounce multiple creatures. This is an interesting one. It is a sorcery, so it's not going to be catching the opponent off guard necessarily. Yeah, uh, this one I could be off on the evaluation and I'll have to see it in action. My initial feeling is that it's good but not great. Um, so I think C is probably where I fall on split the party. A decent tempo play, although it's a little bit on the pricey side. Sudden Insight is a 6 mana instant and uncommon lets you draw a card for each different mana value among non-land cards in your graveyard. So for this to be exciting, it would have to draw us about four cards. And having four different mana values in your graveyard by the time you can cast this isn't trivial. So I'm not super high on Sudden Insight. I think this is probably closer to a D. And there's some better card draw spells available. Tasha's Hideous Laughter, a three mana sorcery at rare. Says each opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until that player has exiled cards with a total mana value of 20 or more. So this card at first might seem incredible. Once you do the math, you get to some interesting conclusions. So on average, the mana value of actual spells in a limited deck will be around 3, give or take a, a few percentages and let's say an average of 17 lands. That means that on average Hideous Laughter might mill around 12 or 13 cards, give or take. It's comparable to Madden and Cacophony, we pay one more mana but we mill a couple more cards. Now the big difference here is that there's no real mill synergies in this set. It does exile so there's no benefits for the opponent for putting the cards in their graveyard but that's kind of besides the point. The reason you would play Hideous Laughter is to use it as an alternate win condition to mill the opponent out instead of winning by dealing damage. And casting a single copy of Hideous Laughter is not going to accomplish that. If somehow you find a way to cast two copies of Hideous Laughter, either by returning it from your graveyard back to your hand or by drafting multiple copies, at that point, Hideous Laughter could be a real win condition, because if you cast two of these, it doesn't take much else to win the game. So I don't think I can quite give this an F, because there are circumstances where this could actually be a, a real win condition. But overall, probably a D, 
and not a card you should evaluate very highly. Trickster's Talisman is next, a 1 mana equipment at Uncommon, saying the equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 1, and whenever this creature deals comma damage to a player, you may sacrifice a Talisman, and if you do, create a token that's a copy of this creature. And the equip cost is 2. So, a relatively cheap equipment that makes your creature a bit bigger, makes it easier to connect in the first place, and then you can potentially double up on a creature. So this will be at its best in a deck with a lot of evasive creatures that can easily connect and then you can double up. So that's kind of where I see this card being at its best. Not going to be great in every deck. I think I land on C for Trickster's Talisman, a fine card in some specific cases. True Polymorph is a 6 mana rare at instant speed and says target artifact or creature becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature. So this card can do a lot of different things. We can turn our smallest creature into whatever the largest creature on the battlefield is, whether it's our creature or the opponent's creature. We can turn the opponent's creature into the smallest thing on the battlefield. We can turn something into an artifact. We can potentially, if we have a large bomb in play, we can get two of them. So it does a lot of cool things. Um, it doesn't always pull us ahead if we're behind, since it at most brings us to parity. If we're already ahead, this can put us even further ahead. It's not necessarily a game-ending card, but it's also not bad. It always does something useful. Uh, if we're both at parity and creatures are roughly the same size, then it's possible that True Polymorph doesn't do much. But in most cases, it will pretty much answer the opponent's biggest thing, which is not bad for six mana. It's also an instant, so it can potentially lead to some blowouts as well. Still not super high on True Polymorph. I think it's probably closer to a C plus. Six mana is kind of pricey if at the end of the day we're just removing the opponent's biggest card. But uh, it can of course do more than that. Next is a Wizard class, a one mana enchantment class at Uncommon. Says you have no maximum hand size, but that's not why we're interested in this. Since level two, three mana for a divination, we can draw two cards. And then five more mana to level three, saying whenever we draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Now this also includes our regular draw step. So once we get to level three, this card can easily get out of hand. And again, there's not that many cards we're going to play on turn one. So playing this on turn one and then Eventually casting a 3 mana divination is not a bad deal. And then on top of that we get this 5 mana mana sink that can potentially help us take over the late game. So there's a lot to like about wizard class and I'm happy giving this a B. Next up is wizard's spellbook 7 mana for a rare artifact that can tap to exile target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard. Then we roll a d20 and that uh, can only be used at sorcery speed. So if we roll between 1 and 9, we can copy that card and cast that copy. Still have to pay its mana cost. If we get between 10 and 19, we copy that card and then cast a copy by only paying 1 mana rather than its mana cost. And if we roll a 20, we copy each card exiled with the wizard spellbook, and we may cast any number without paying their mana costs. So Wizard Spellbook definitely promises to take over the late game. Seven mana is a lot, and the turn we play it, we're unlikely to cast another spell, since even if we get between a 10 and a 19, we still have to pay one mana, so it's essentially eight mana to play a spellbook and then hopefully cast something. So it's pretty slow. But assuming there's been some powerful instants and sorceries cast during the game, this can double dip and take over the late game. So overall, Wizard Spellbook 
gets a B. Powerful card, but it does take some time to get it going. You come to a river, a two mana instant at common, lets you choose between finding the current, which means returning target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, or you can find a crossing and give a creature plus hump or so until end of turn, and it cannot be blocked this turn. So a potential way to enable your rogue synergies and also find bounce spell at the same time. So both modes are useful and especially in the blue black kind of rogue archetype where you care about creatures connecting. This is going to be at its best. So easily a C plus for you come to a river. Nice versatile card. Then you find the villain's lair, a three mana instant that lets you choose between foiling their scheme, which means countering target spell, or learn their secrets and draw two and then discard two. So draw two, discard two, not a great ability since it's still card disadvantage since we had to play a card to get that effect in the first place. Countering a spell, of course, is always useful. And then having the versatility of sometimes using the looting effect in our turn as opposed to using it as a counter, I guess is just pure upside. So I don't think this is as good as the other counter spell we've seen. Double blue is a bit more difficult to keep up, but it's still an okay counter spell. And there's definitely some bombs in the set worth countering, as we've seen some very powerful mythic rare dragons already. So that does make counter spells a bit better than they would be otherwise. So still gets a C overall. Next is you see a guard approach, one mana instant at common, can either distract the guard to tap target creature or hide, and then a creature we control gains hexproof until end of turn. So again, none of these modes are particularly impactful, can save a creature from removal, but I don't really see myself including this in uh, most decks, so gets a D. And then we have 1T, a Malison, a 2-mana, two 2-1 two Snake Rogue at rare, and cannot be blocked as long as it's attacking alone. And when it deals combat damage to a player, we can venture into the dungeon. So by itself, this can easily complete a dungeon for you. If you play this on turn 2, the opponent's going to be pretty sad if they don't have an immediate answer for it. So... Yeah, this card's a beating, and I'm not looking forward to facing this early on. I think this is a bomb, and perfect for the blue-white venture deck. And our first black card is a Serarok, the Arch Lich. A 3-mana 5-5 five five legendary zombie wizard and mythic. And when the Arch Lich enters the battlefield, if you haven't completed Tomb of Annihilation, return it to its owner's hand and venture into the dungeon. So for those that aren't aware, Tomb of Annihilation is the dungeon that has the least amount of uh, rooms to explore, so it can either be completed in three or four attempts. So it is definitely the one that can be completed the fastest and that's best for an aggressively slanted deck. And uh, yeah, once we do complete our dungeon, we get access to a 3-mana 5-5 five five, that whenever it attacks, for each opponent we get to make a 2-2 two two black zombie creature token unless that player sacrifices a creature. So pretty big payoff for quickly completing a dungeon and it does give us kind of a built-in way to venture and complete the Tomb of Annihilation. So yeah, there's a lot to like about this. It is a pretty big mana investment if you have to cast it multiple times to complete the dungeon but the eventual payoff is worth it. So I think B is fair for the Arch Lich. Next is Osmodius, the Archfiend, a 6 mana, 6-6 six, six legendary devil god at rare. Says if you would draw a card, exile the top card of your library face down instead. That's not necessarily an advantage. For 3 mana, we can draw 7 cards, but keep in mind those cards will be exiled 
And how do we get access to those cards? Well, we can play, we, we can pay one black mana to return all cards exiled with Zmodius to their owner's hands, and we lose life equal to the amount of cards. Could potentially draw a lot of cards, reminiscent of uh, Necropotence. So potentially a very powerful card draw engine. Not going to be able to draw seven very often if we're planning to actually put those cards into our hands. But at the same time, we get a 6-6 that, you know, is reasonably standard and at the same time can promise to completely take over the late game if our life total isn't under any pressure. But uh, yeah, still a reasonable card. I think this also lands in the B range where it has a lot of potential, not going to be able to use its ability to its full extent in every game. But when we do, this will be the reason why we win the game. Next is Baleful Beholder, another Beholder creature type. 6 mana, 6 5, that when it enters the battlefield we either make the opponent sacrifice an enchantment or creatures we control gain menace until end of turn. So giving our creatures menace could be a nice way to enable some good attacks, especially in the rogue decks. And then sacrificing an enchantment can also be relevant, especially against various removal spells in enchantment form. And a 6 5 for 6 is not terrible stats, so yeah, Baleful Beholder seems decent, at the very least a C, but I could see this uh, edging its way up to a C+. Black Dragon, another one of the uncommon dragon cycle, 7 mana 4-4 four, four, with flying, and when Black Dragon enters the battlefield, target creature the opponent controls gets minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn. So potentially a nice removal effect when it enters, and it's still a 4-4 flyer afterwards. So yeah, another solid B, I think, as we've rated all the other uncommon dragons so far. Next is the Book of Vile Darkness. A triple black legendary artifact at Mythic says at the beginning of your end step, if you lost two or more life this turn, make a 2-2 black zombie creature token. We can also tap and exile the book and artifacts we control named Eye of Vecna and Hand of Vecna to create Vecna, a legendary 8-8 black zombie god creature token with indestructible, and it also gains all triggered abilities of the exiled cards. Now do keep in mind, Eye of Vecna and Hand of Vecna are both rare cards, so the chances of getting all three of these in a draft are pretty small. And the effect by itself to make zombie tokens when we lose life has a little bit of synergy here and there, but for the most part I would pass on the Book of Vile Darkness, difficult to cast, and uh, yeah, I don't see many circumstances where I'm gonna want access to this. So I think we're gonna spare the Book of Vile Darkness from, from an F rating, but definitely a D. Check for Traps is a 2 mana sorcery. Ant Uncommon says target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a non-land card from it, exile that card, and if it's an instance or a card with flash, the opponent loses one, otherwise we lose one. So similar to Agonizing Remorse from Theros, find discard spell. This doesn't hit the graveyard, but there's also fewer graveyard synergies, so kind of balances out. And just a fine discard effect for limiteds, especially useful if the opponent has some bombs that you otherwise have trouble dealing with. So C for check for traps. Clattering skeletons, a 4 mana 4 3 skeleton and common, so potentially a synergy with those uh, black green skeleton cards as well. And when the skeleton dies, venture into the dungeon. So instead of venturing when it enters a battlefield, like some of the white cards, this triggers when it dies. And a 4-3 for 4, 4 mana is pretty decent stats for a black creature. Probably give this a C plus as a solid black creature, and gonna be at its best in the black-white venture deck. Deadly Dispute, a 2 mana instant at common, as an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice an artifact or creature. And then we get to draw two cards and create a treasure token. So if we already have a treasure, 
can sacrifice it and then draw two, make another one. Not a bad deal. So this is going to be at its best in a black-red treasure deck. And uh, probably give it a C outside of the red-black deck. Probably not going to be very interested. And Death Priest of Miracle, a 4 mana 2-2 two, two, Tiefling Cleric and Uncommon. Saying Skeletons, Vampires and Zombies you control get plus one plus one. So a Lord for all the unloved creature types. And at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you can pay one mana. And if you do, make a 1-1 one, one black skeleton creature token. So this will be at its best in the black-green archetype that has some sacrifice synergies or other effects that care about creatures dying. Could also be good in black-reds where you've got some sacrifice synergy. And uh, you might end up with more skeletons, vampires and zombies. That being said, if your deck doesn't have a ton of those creatures or sacrifice outlets, this is a bit underpowered for 4 mana. So I think C plus is fair for the Death Priest. A bit of a build around, but the payoff is potentially there. Demogorgon's Clutches is a 3 mana sorcery at Uncommon. And this is probably one of the best mind rot effects we've seen to date. Target opponent discards two cards, mills two cards, and loses two life. So, yeah, pretty solid effect for limited. It's probably going to be better in sealed than draft. But even in draft, this seems to be a relatively slow format with people holding some expensive six and seven mana bombs that you can potentially snipe with the clutches. So I'm going to start out with a C for clutches, but I could easily see this being a C plus if the format ends up being slow enough for it. Devour Intellect, on the other hand, I'm not super interested in. A 1-mana Sorcery, making the opponent discard a card. And then if mana from a treasure was spent, instead this turns into a more targeted discard effect. And then we can choose any non-land card to make the opponent discard. So, you know, discard effects in Limited are going to fluctuate in value based on how fast the format is. But... Without sacrificing a treasure token, this is an untargeted discard effect, so the opponents can easily get rid of a land that they don't need. And uh, to turn this into a targeted discard effect, you have to jump through quite a few hoops. So not super into Devour Intellect, we'll give this a D. A Drider, a 5-mana 4-3 Elf Spider at Uncommon, has Reach. And whenever Drider deals combat damage to a player, create a 2-1 black spider creature token with menace and reach. And uh, yeah, that token doesn't mess around. A 2-1 with menace and reach is a real card. And uh, it's both good on offense and defense. So will require a bit of help. Going to be at its best in presumably the blue-black archetype where you've got other ways to give it evasion. Although being a 4-powered creature means that there's a few effects that won't be able to make this unblockable, as we'll see in a second. So it's a little bit awkward. Uh, five mana is kind of expensive, uh, so it's unlikely to hit the opponent without help from other cards. So I think C plus is fine for Drider. And Dungeon Crawlers, a one mana two one zombie at uncommon, enters battlefield tapped. And whenever you complete a dungeon, you may return Dungeon Crawler from your graveyard to your hand. So a nice payoff for completing dungeons in an aggressive black-white deck. That being said, not an incredibly high-impact card by the time you complete a dungeon. How relevant is a 2-1 going to be? So C for Dungeon Crawler, but a fine card can play it early and potentially trade for the opponent's 2-drop. Ebon Death Dracolich is the mythic rare legendary dragon in black. This is a zombie dragon. So 4 mana, 5-2 with flash and flying. But it's not going to do much ambushing with flash because it also enters a battlefield tapped. The reason you can still play it at instant speed is that you can cast Ebon Death from your graveyard if a creature not named Ebon Death died this turn. So let's say we're in the opponent's turn, some creatures end up trading, we can still cast this and uh, get it back that way. So this is a recursive, evasive, high-powered creature 
that demands an answer and even if it does get answered can potentially still come back to haunt the opponent and it's pretty easy to enable the last clause so i think this meets the requirements of an s a bomb that's difficult to deal with and will give the opponent a lot of headaches even if they do somehow get rid of it and that's also another reason why a removal spell like charm sleep is more valuable in this set than usual eyes of the beholder six mana instant at common giving a creature minus 11 minus 11 until end of turn yeah they're making us pay a lot of mana for removal these days this is instant speed and will take care of pretty much any creature in the set but six mana is a lot and uh, there's definitely some more efficient removal spells available so while i'm probably still gonna include this in most limited decks i'm not excited about it so give this a c next is fates reversal a two mana sorcery at common returns up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand and then venture into the dungeon we're used to seeing these effects in limited sometimes we get a two for one in this case not quite a two for one but we can venture into the dungeon so you know fine role player in most black decks i imagine you're going to be happy to have one of these to get back your key creature so it can uh, be replayed once again and if you're the black white um, venture deck this will be even better so c seems fine here Fain death one mana for an instance says until end of turn target creature gains when this creature dies return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on it problem is you're kind of forced to keep up one mana at all times so having to play a turn behind of casting your bomb can make a pretty big difference pretty situational so i'm not the biggest fan we'll give this a d Forsworn Paladin, single black for a 1-1 human knight at rare, has menace, and for two mana we can tap it, pay one life, and create a treasure token. So pretty rare to see a black card that actually ramps. And then for three mana, target creature gets plus two plus O until end of turn. If mana from a treasure was spent to activate this ability, that creature also gains death touch until end of turn. Now we can target any creature to give it plus two plus so and of course the first ability enables a second ability to give death touch and targeting the paladin itself that already has menace also synergizes nicely with death touch so paladin's pretty good especially for one drop where you're usually not doing much can help your ramp is perfect for the black reds treasure deck where you've got additional synergies with treasure tokens and uh nice mana sink in the late game so maybe not quite as powerful as knight of the abel legion from back in the day but it does get close i think i'm willing to give this a b just because of how impactful this can be in the late game I can potentially use the pump ability multiple times as well and of course the more treasures we have the better then we have gelatinous cube a four mana four three ooze at rare and when it enters the battlefield we can exile target a non ooze creature and opponent controls until the cube leaves the battlefield but even if the opponent would have an answer for cube eventually we can make sure that the exiled creature doesn't come back if we pay x and black we can put a creature card with mana value x or less or i guess mana value x exactly exiled with the gelatinous cube into its owner's graveyard so we get a 4-3 removes the opponent's scariest card and if we have the mana for it we can make sure that card doesn't come back even if the cube eventually leaves the battlefield so powerful cards seems to be on the level of mind flayer so gets an a and grim bounty is a four mana sorcery that destroys target creature or planeswalker and we get to make a treasure token so this seems to be the premium removal spell that black gets access to quite a bit cheaper than eyes of the beholder so i think this is the removal spell that gets a b in black 
Grim Wonder is next, a 2 mana 5-3 Goblin Warlock and uncommon with flash, but there's a catch, we can only cast this if a creature died this turn. So very unlikely to be able to play this on turn 2. So you're gonna have to pick your spots and be happy casting this even if it's not ideal, making this a lot worse than it looks. That being said, it's still pretty big and in the black green deck specifically, that cares about creatures dying and might have some sacrifice synergies, this goes up in value. So I think a C overall for Grim Wonder. A reasonable card, but just don't expect this to come down very early. Herald of Hadar is a 5 mana 4 4 human warlock. And similar to the blue 2 drop, this has a 6 mana activated ability that lets us roll a d20. In this case, if we get between 1 and 9, each opponent loses 2 life. Between 10 and 19, each opponent loses 2 and we gain 2. And if we hit a 20, each opponent loses 2, we gain 2, and we get to make 2 treasure tokens. So 5 mana 4-4 four, four with a relevant upside ability seems pretty decent. Good synergy with potential life gain synergies and treasure synergies in black, reds specifically. So C plus for Herald seems like a fine role player. Hired Hexblades, a 2 mana 2 2 L4 lock at common. When it enters the battlefield, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, you get to draw a card and lose one life. Problem with Hexblade is that on turn 2, you're unlikely to already have a treasure. So on turn 2, it's not that exciting. In the late game, if you already have a treasure, then it can turn into a cantrip, which is nice because. Problem with two drops in the late game is that they're not very impactful, but if this replaces itself, you're less sad about it. But it's not quite as good as the two drops with a mana sink ability, because if you've already cast this earlier in the game, it doesn't necessarily turn into a relevant creature in the late game. I think this is closer to a D than a C, but if your deck really needs a two drop, then you might still play this anyway. Horde Robber is a two mana 1 3 that when it deals combat damage to a player, creates a treasure token. So if you're on the play and the opponent misses their 2-drop, this can potentially get out of hand. But under most circumstances, I'm not incredibly high on the, the robber. We've seen better cards in blue-black that reward you for hitting the opponent. Just making a treasure token is not that exciting. So D for the robber. Lightfoot Rogue, on the other hand, so 2 mana, 2 1, Halfling Rogue at uncommon. And whenever the Rogue attacks, we can roll a d20. If we get between 1 and 9, it gains Death Touch. 10 and 19, it gets plus 0 and Death Touch. And if we get a 20, it gets plus 3 plus 0, First Strike and Death Touch until end of turn. So this card wants to be attacking, it doesn't have Death Touch on defense. But it does do a very good job of attacking and is always going to trade for something from the opponent. So at its best in a more aggressive deck, so thinking black-red or maybe black-white. So seems like a pretty solid 2-drop. C+, plus, with a caveat that your deck needs to be aggressive and not really a card that wants to sit back. Then we have Loth, Spider Queen, 5 mana, 4 loyalty. Legendary Loth Planeswalker with a passive ability saying whenever a creature you control dies, put a loyalty counter on the Spider Queen. And we've got a few ways to fuel that ability. The first loyalty ability is zero, so it doesn't change loyalty, but lets us draw a card and lose one life. So nice card draw engine. The minus three generates two, two, one black spider creature tokens with menace and reach. So it gives us a nice board presence and some creatures that will help us increase loyalty. Then the minus eight is pretty strange, but gives us an emblem saying whenever an opponent is dealt combat damage by one or more creatures you control, if that player lost less than eight life this turn, they lose life equal to the difference. So what it basically means is if the opponent took a bit of damage, they're now going to take at least eight damage. So perfect alongside the menacing spider tokens, because now 
only one of them needs to connect to deal 8 damage. Although re realistically we're probably not going to use the ultimates and instead just make more 2-1 to tokens to take over the game with. So Spider Queen seems great. It stabilizes. It, it can stabilize the turn it comes into play. On a stalled board it will take over the game. The only thing it doesn't do is kill an opposing creature, but getting those reaching spider tokens we can even block some large flyers from the opponent. So Spider Queen seems like an S worthy card and will uh, easily take over a game. Next is Manticore. 4 mana, 2-1 Manticore with Flash and Flying. I'm surprised the name wasn't taken yet. And when the Manticore enters battlefield, destroy target creature an opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. So we've seen similar effects like this in the past, but typically not on a creature with Flash and definitely not on a flash creature that also flies. Yeah, the Manticore's interesting. We can potentially have some random blockers on defense, opponent attacks with her large creature, we chum block, end of turn flash and Manticore, kill the opponent's big creature and have a flyer to pressure their life total. Of course, we're not always going to have some disposable creatures to chump with. Uh, does pair well with I guess uh, first strike, so if we have any first striking creatures, this does get better. Can also, of course, use this in our own turn, attack with creatures and then flash this in to finish something off. It is a little bit conditional in nature, but it, it's usually not difficult to kill the thing you want to kill. And then a 2-1 flyer is still a relevant body afterwards. So I'm leaning C plus on Manticore. Um, does require a bit of setup, also a card that maybe goes down in value as, as the format progresses and people learn to play around it. But uh, yeah, seems like a solid card. Next is Power Ward Kill, a 2 mana instant at uncommon that destroys target non-angel, non-demon, non-devil, non-dragon creature. That last one especially is relevant in a set where there's a cycle of uncommon dragons and even more rare and mythic dragons. So it does miss on killing some of the more important creatures in the set. But at the end of the day it's still 2 mana for a very efficient removal spell. And instant speed to boot. So I think a B for power ward kill is still correct here. Precipitous drop is a 3 mana enchantment aura, enchants a creature. And when it enters the battlefield we also get to venture into the dungeon. The enchanted creature gets minus two, minus two, so we want to put this on the opponent's creature. But it also gets minus five, minus five instead, as long as we've completed a dungeon. So perfect for the black whites venture deck. Assuming we have other ways to venture and complete a dungeon, this turns into a very attractive removal spell. So a C plus for precipitous drop and can go up and down in value depending on how many other ways we have to venture. A Ray of Enfeeblements is another one of the Cycle of Hate cards. This is a 1 mana instant at uncommon, giving a creature minus 4 minus 1 until end of turn. Now if that creature is white, it gets minus 4 minus 4 until end of turn instead. So I spent quite a bit of time thinking about whether or not this might be worth main decking. I think the final conclusion is probably not happy to main deck this but an excellent sideboard card, so that puts this in the D category. Reaper's Talisman is a 1 mana artifact equipment at uncommon. It says whenever equipped creature deals, or whenever the equipped creature attacks, it gains death touch until end of turn, and when the equipped creature attacks alone, defending player loses 2 life and we gain 2 life, and the equip cost is 2. So this can play well in a deck with small evasive creatures where we can consistently drain the opponent for two, turning this into a pretty nice uh, life swing. And giving the creature death touch of course pairs well with first strike or double strike and pairs well with uh, smaller creatures that we don't care if they die and if the opponent blocks they're forced to trade. So. A card that of course wants to be in a deck that wants to be more aggressive, because it doesn't do much on defense. 
So, assuming your deck is aggressive enough, this might even go up to a C+, as it's very difficult to race for the opponent, and it's relatively cheap to play and equip. Um, in a more defensive deck, you just don't want this at all. So, C+, for aggressive decks. Sepulchre's Ghoul is a 2-mana, two 2-1 two zombie at common that can sacrifice another creature, and then the Sepulchre Ghoul gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. Can only be activated once each turn, although can also be activated during the opponent's turn at instant speed. So the threat of activation is what potentially makes this card powerful. Also gives a sacrifice outlet to potentially combine with smaller creatures, can trigger death synergies for black green, plays well with the act of treason in black red. So I think at the end of the day, probably still a C for the ghoul. Having only one toughness means that uh, a lot of creatures can still trade after only one sacrifice, and we cannot sacrifice more than one creature each turn, but could potentially be a role player to enable a bunch of different synergies. Shambling Ghast is a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one zombie at common. When it dies, we can either give an opposing creature minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn, similar to Grim Harrow Specs, we've seen cards like this in the past, or we can make a treasure token. So a pretty low impact card, potential sacrifice fodder for various sacrifice engines, but usually not worth a card. There's also not that many high value one toughness creatures that are worth killing. So I'm pretty low on uh, Shambling Ghast, we'll give this a D. But a good card against any aggressive deck, so potentially a sideboard inclusion. Skullport Merchants, a 3 mana 1 4 dwarf citizen and uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, it makes a treasure token. And for 2 mana, we can sacrifice another creature or treasure to draw a card. So eventually, we'll draw a card by sacrificing the treasure it came with, but can also just use it to ramp and eventually use this as a sacrifice outlet or as a way to turn treasures into additional cards. So, yeah, there's a lot to like about the Skullport Merchant. And uh, even without too much treasure synergy, it's still a fine card. If some creature is about to get removed, or if a creature is enchanted by an opposing removal spell, we can still get value from it. So cards like this usually tend to overperform in limited. So C plus for Skullport Merchant. Next is Sphere of Annihilation. A rare artifact for X and black. Enters the battlefield with X Void Counters on it. And at the beginning of your upkeep, Exile, Sphere of Annihilation, all creatures and planeswalkers with mana value less than or equal to the number of Void Counters. And the same goes for creatures in graveyards and planeswalkers as well. So it's a sweeper that takes a turn to get going. So the opponent will see it coming, so they're not gonna overextend into it, besides what they already have in play. So that does make it a lot less powerful than your regular sweeper that kills everything on the spot. And if the opponent managed to ramp out anything big, you'll also need access to more mana before you can get rid of it. That being said, Sphere of Annihilation is still potentially a nice way to hit the reset button and uh, is usually gonna put your head on card advantage, even if it means the opponent gets one last attack in with all their creatures and you end up taking a bunch of extra damage. So I think B for Sphere of Annihilation is reasonable. Powerful effect, but not as good as a regular sweeper, of course. Thieves Tools is a 2-mana equipment. And when it enters the battlefield, you get to make a treasure token. So can be especially useful in black-red. And the equipped creature cannot be blocked as long as it has power 3 or less. And it equips for 2-mana. So not only is the treasure token useful in black-red, but making a creature unblockable, especially powerful in blue-black, where we have a lot of creatures that have some nice payoffs for hitting the opponent. Especially the blue 3-drop that draws a card comes to mind. So Thieves' Tools seems great for those more aggressively slanted decks that need a way to grant their creatures evasion. Now the Sad nonbo here is that it doesn't make Drider unblockable since it has 4 power. So not a combo with Drider, sadly. 
but still very good in blue-black and potentially black-red as well. So I think at the end of the day, C for Thieves tools, still a bit of a mana investment to make something unblockable, so not going to be great if you're under a ton of pressure, but uh, overall seems like a nice synergy card. Vampire Spawn is a 3 mana 2-3, that when it enters a battlefield, each opponent loses two and you gain two. So a solid three drop that uh, will fill out your curve nicely, can maybe enable some life gain synergy, even though that's mostly a green-white thing. So yeah, just a fine curve filler if you need a three drop, nothing special, gets a C. A Vorpal Sword is next, this is anything but filler. A one mana artifact equipment at rare, giving the equipped creature plus two plus zero and death touch. And it's only double black to equip, so it turns any creature into something that can at the very least trade for an opposing creature, discounting first strike or double strike. And then there's more. For eight mana, until end of turn, Vorpal Sword gains the ability. Whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. So all of a sudden put this on an evasive creature, pay 8 mana, and you win the game. So yeah, Vorpal Sword I think is similar to the other rare equipments we've seen so far in white, the Dancing Sword, in that it's very efficient to both play and equip, gives a relevant bonus, and then there's even more on top of that. In this case winning the game is pretty nice, so this is bomb status. A for Vorpal Sword. Then we have the Warlock class, a 1 mana enchantment class at Uncommon. The passive ability says at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, each opponent loses one life. So a bit of incremental life loss is always nice. On the second level for 2 mana, we can look at the top 3 cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, rest in our graveyard. So decent cantrip ability. And then for 7 mana, level 3, so it's a pretty big mana investment to get there. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses life equal to the life they lost this turn. So essentially doubles up or damage output. So Warlock class, expensive to get to the last level, but even just playing it and then drawing an extra card with a level 2 will replace itself and then still get some incidental damage from the level 1 ability. So yeah, there's a lot to like about the Warlock class. So C plus for Warlock class seems appropriate. Now this next card, I had kind of a double take when I read it for the first time. Westgate Regent, a 5 mana 4-4 four, four vampire with flying, has wards, which makes the opponent discard a card if they want to target this. So already powerful flyer that requires at least two cards from the opponent to answer it. And then there's more. Whenever the regent deals comma damage to player, put that many plus one plus one counters on it. So we've got a 4-4, we hit the opponent, now we've got an 8-8 flyer. Good luck, have fun. Yeah, this gets an S. It may not be a mythic rare dragon, but a card that threatens to win the game very quickly by itself. And even if the opponent does remove it, it's going to cost them a ton of resources. That's the definition of an S. A white is a 2 mana 3-2 zombie soldier at rare. Enters battlefield tapped. Whenever a creature dealt damage by white this turn dies, create a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token and exile that card. So very aggressively costed, 2 mana 3-2, can get in the red zone right away, and if it does end up trading, we get another 2-2 zombie out of the deal. So yeah, very efficient card, happy giving this a B. Then Huan Ti Fang Blade is a 3 mana 2-2 two -two snake rogue at common with death touch. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, venture into the dungeon. So this, unlike the uncommon 2-drop, also has death touch on defense. So plays both offense and defense nicely. And 
yeah, it kind of forces the opponent to trade for it eventually, because they can't really let you keep venturing into the dungeon. So very annoying card to face, and uh, if you can give it evasion somehow, can also get even better. So C plus for the Fang Blade. Zombie Ogre is a 5 mana 3 5. Zombie Ogre, pretty straightforward. It's a common at the beginning of your end step. If a creature died this turn, venture into the dungeon. So, potentially a repeatable way to venture into the dungeon. Problem is, we're kind of paying a lot of mana for not a ton of power and toughness necessarily. Would be at its best in kind of black green, where you might have more cards that care about creatures being sacrificed or creatures dying, but that's not necessarily the color pair that's best at making use of uh, completing a dungeon. So, not a fan of Zombie Ogre. Give this a D. But you could do worse in terms of filler if you just need something big at 5 mana. And our first red card is Armory Veteran, a 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Orc Warrior at common. As long as it's equipped, it has menace. So yeah, perfect card for the red-white equipment deck. And even outside of red-white, there's a lot of equipment floating around, and mana is a useful ability to put on a 2-drop, so... Yeah, I like C+, for Armory Veteran, one of the better 2-drops you can have. Barbarian class is a 1-mana enchantment class and uncommon. Says if you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. So that's the second time we've seen a similar effect. So blue and red, definitely the color pair that cares most about rolling dice. If you get level two for two mana, whenever you roll one or more dice, target creature you control gets plus two plus so and gains menace until end of turn. And level three for three mana, creatures you control have haste. Very useful ability to give to all your creatures. So, assuming you have lots of dice rolling synergies in your deck, Barbarian class seems quite strong. So we'll give this a C+. Without any dice rolling synergies, you probably want to give this a pass. Battle Cry Goblin, a 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Goblin at Uncommon. And for 2 mana, goblins you control get plus 1 plus 0 and gain haste until end of turn. So that also includes itself, so for 4 mana this is a 3-2 haste essentially, and can potentially pump it even more. And pack tactics, not the first time we've seen this reminder word. In this case, not the same effect as the previous one, but still has the same condition that has to be met, meaning if the creature in question attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power 6 or greater this combat, create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking in this case. So yeah, the first ability can enable the second one, and there's a few ways to generate goblins and even goblin tokens in the set, which can help you go wide to make use of the battle cry goblin. So C plus for battle cry goblin seems like one of the better 2-drops in red. Boots of Speed, a 1-mana equipment and common. Equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 0 and has haste. And the equip cost is just 1 mana, so incredibly cheap to both play and equip. And essentially means all future creatures just cost 1 extra mana to give them haste, which seems very useful. So. All your creatures turn into real threats off the top of your deck, and uh, yeah, the opponent will have to respect that haste ability, and maybe have to leave back additional blockers that they otherwise wouldn't have to leave back. So I like C plus for Boots of Speed. It does have diminishing returns, so you're probably not going to want more than one of this in your deck. But assuming you're an aggressive deck and you have maybe some equipment synergy, this seems like a great card. A brazen Dwarf is a 2-mana 1-3 Dwarf Shaman at common. Says whenever you roll one or more dice, the Dwarf deals one damage to each opponent. It's another dice rolling payoff card. So, outside of a deck that uh, cares about rolling dice, this is not really a card you want. In the dice rolling synergy deck, it's okay. It kind of depends how many dice you expect to be rolling at the end of the day. 
and uh, yeah, if this gets in four or five damage, then it definitely did its job. Also a body to potentially equip if you've got equipment laying around. So, you know, random small creatures are more valuable in this set than they would be otherwise. So I think C for Brazen Dwarf, assuming you've got at least five or more ways to roll dice in your deck, otherwise probably closer to a D. Burning Hands, two mana instant at uncommon, deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker, but if that permanent is green, it deals six damage instead. So another one of the hate cycle. This one seems totally fine, even without targeting a green card, and uh, has random upside against green, which is a nice bonus, but still happy with this outside of uh, facing a green deck. So C plus for Burning Hands. Chaos Channeler is a 4 mana for 3 human shaman at uncommon. And whenever Channeler attacks, you can roll a d20. If you get between 1 and 9, exile the top card of your library, and you may play it this turn. 10 and 19 can exile the top 2 cards of our library to play, and playing means it also includes lands. And if you get a natural 20, top 3 cards instead. So this is especially powerful if we can give it haste or evasion somehow, so we can potentially enable it multiple times. And the card advantage from Chowler definitely starts adding up. 4 mana 4 3 means it's most likely gonna at least trade for an opposing creature while providing extra cards. So there's a lot to like about Chaos Channeler, and I think it's worthy of a B, a card that's probably gonna be a 2 for 1 and potentially uh, can snowball even more. Critical hits a 2 mana instant at uncommon, giving a creature double strike until end of turn. It's a reasonable combo trick, and when you roll a D, or when you roll a natural 20 rather, return a critical hit from your graveyard to your hands. So if your deck was already interested in the double strike effect and happens to have some dice rolling synergy, then uh, that's a nice bonus. So C for critical hits, and probably goes up in value based on how many dice rolling effects you have. Delina, Wild Mage, 4 mana, 3, 2, Elf Shaman, at rare, it's legendary, and whenever Delina attacks, choose target creature you control, doesn't have to be an attacking creature necessarily, and then roll a d20. If we get between 1 and 14, so pretty high percentage chance, we create a tapped and attacking creature token that's a copy of that creature, except it's not legendary and gets exiled at the end of combat. So Delina is joined by an extra token, but if we get lucky and get between 15 and 20, we create one of those tokens and then we get to roll again. So imagine having a few ways to roll extra dice to improve our odds, we could potentially keep hitting between 15 and 20 and just completely go off. Unlikely to happen, but you know, this could essentially win the game with one attack. If you're incredibly lucky, definitely a, a fun card to maybe also build around with in Constructed. As far as Limited is concerned, not the easiest card to evaluate. Uh, Delina herself is probably only going to be attacking once and the opponent's going to be able to trade off for it. So the damage Delina does kind of depends on how big the creature is you're going to copy and how many dice rolls you end up winning. So C plus for Delina, but definitely going to lead to some pretty fun moments. Dragon's Fire, a 2 mana instant at common. As an additional cost to cast it, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand or choose a dragon in play. And then Dragon's Fire deals 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker if we reveal the dragon or choose a dragon we control. Then we deal damage equal to the power of that card or creature instead. So this is going to be the premier common in red. Just by itself, 3 damage for 2 mana at instant speed is perfect. And has even more upside if you happen to have some dragons. So this is an easy B for Dragon's Fire. 
Dueling Rapier is a one mana artifact equipment at common. It has flash, so we can play it out at instant speed. And the equipped creature gets plus two plus O. Oh, and when the Rapier enters the battlefield, we can attach it to a creature we control right away. So similar to the equipment in Zendikar. And then if we want to move it afterwards, it's going to cost us four mana. So it's kind of like a combat trick that sticks around. Especially nice with evasive creatures or creatures at a first strike or double strike. And uh, yeah, it's just incredibly cheap to play the first time. And can maybe use it to trade up for a bigger creature. And then uh, later in the game, once the game stalls out, we'll give you a nice bonus to give a creature to additional power. So yeah, there's a lot to like about the Rapier. Of course, better in an equipment focused deck. But uh, this seems like a card that can easily overperform C plus for Rapier. Earth Cult Elemental is a six mana six six at common. And when it enters the battlefield, roll a d20 between one and nine. Each player sacrifices a permanent between 10 and 19, each opponent sacrifices a permanent, and if we get a natural 20, each opponent sacrifices two permanents. If we need something big at the top of our curve, this will do, although it doesn't really fit into the red-white equipment deck. Um, a little bit of synergy maybe in uh, red-black when it comes to sacrificing stuff, and I guess red-green, this is a six-powered creature to enable the pack tactics. But uh, yeah, it seems a bit out of place, and the ETB effect isn't necessarily all that beneficial. Opponent can easily sacrifice a land. Yeah, probably just a C for Earth Cult Elemental. If you need a big curve topper, this will do. Fairy Days Fireball, 5 mana instant at common, deals 5 damage to target creature or planeswalker. And then we roll a d20, between 1 and 9 deals 2 damage to each player. Between 10 and 20 deals 2 damage to each opponent. Yeah, this uh, is definitely a nice contender for best red common. Still going to be worse than Dragon's Fire under most circumstances. But this does deal 5 damage, so it can potentially take care of some larger dragons that Dragon's Fire cannot deal with. And uh, randomly has upside of dealing additional damage to the opponent as well. So if you need to deal with some larger creatures, Fireball seems excellent. Doesn't maybe quite get to the B range since it's quite expensive at 5 mana, but at the very least a high C plus and a card you're going to include in pretty much every red deck. Flame Skull is next a 3 mana 3-1 three creature skeleton with flying at mythic rare. Now it cannot block, so it's a card that purely wants to get in the red zone and keep attacking. But keep attacking at will, because when Flame Skull dies, you exile it. If you do, exile the top card of your library, and until the end of your next turn, you may play either one of those cards. So you can either replay Flame Skull, or you can play the exiled card that you got from the top of your deck. So Flame Skull can just keep on coming back over and over. And another reason to like enchantment-based removal, like Charm Sleep, as a more permanent answer for Flame Skull. And uh, yeah, if you play this on turn 3, and you're an aggressive deck, it's going to be a nightmare for the opponent to race an evasive creature that's very hard to take out permanently. This is going to be very difficult to beat, unless the opponent has a very large flyer or reach creature, but there's not many of them. Then of course, not being able to block is a pretty big downside. So maybe that keeps it from quite being an S, since it doesn't always dominate the game. So still an A, just a bomb that uh, probably turns into an S as soon as your uh, deck is curving out and you're playing this on turn 3. Goblin Javelinier is a 1 mana 1 1 Goblin Warrior with haste. And when the Javelinier becomes blocked, it deals 1 damage to target creature blocking it. Yeah, it's a reasonable 1-drop, but probably not going to be very interested in including this outside of maybe a very dedicated Goblin Synergy deck, or a deck that just needs some cheap bodies to equip and you didn't manage to pick up more 2-drops. 
probably just a D for a Goblin Javelinier, but fine curve filler or early creature for an equipment deck potentially. Goblin, a Morning Star is a two mana uncommon equipment, giving the equipped creature plus one plus so and trample. When the Morning Star enters the battlefield, we roll a d20. Between 1 and 9, we get a 1 1 Goblin token. Between 10 and 20, we get a 1 1 token, and we can attach the Morning Star to it. So that turns this into essentially a 2 1 Trampler. So definitely a high variance card in that sense. But uh, yeah, a decent equipment nonetheless that comes with a creature, so at least you'll have something to equip even if there's no other creatures in play. So I like C plus for Morningstar. Historically speaking, all these equipments that come with creatures tend to overperform and limit it, and this one's relatively cheap to play and equip. Hoarding Ogre is a 4 mana 3-3 three, three Ogre at common. When it attacks, we roll a d20. Between 1 and 9, we make a treasure. 10 and 19, 2 treasures, and 23 treasures. So I can already picture an ogre generating three treasure and ramping into some powerful dragon on turn five. But for the most part, we can count on the ogre trading for an opposing creature and maybe making a small uh, mana boost that can help us also fix our mana potentially. But for the most part, just a fine filler creature Maybe a bit better in black reds where we have those treasure token synergies going. But uh, I wouldn't overrate this, so probably just a fine C filler creature. Hobgoblin Bandit's Lord is a 3 mana 2 3 goblin rogue at rare, giving other goblins we control plus 1 plus 1. Can pay a red mana, tap it, and then the Bandit Lord deals damage equal to the number of goblins that enter the battlefield under our control this turn to any target. Now, there are a few ways to make multiple goblins at once, but it's mostly one or two commons. So, not that many ways to make use of that extra ability, but there are a few random goblins that uh, might get the plus one plus one bonus, and still a three mana two three, which isn't terribly standard. So, C plus for the Bandit Lord, assuming we've got some goblins to synergize with it. Hobgoblin Captain is a 2 mana 3 1 at common with pack tactics, saying the captain gains first strike until end of turn. So 2 mana 3 1 potentially gains first strike, plays well with equipment and it's just generally good in any aggressive deck. So a curve that starts out with double Hobgoblin Captain is going to be pretty scary to face. Probably lean C plus on the Hobgoblin Captain. Since there's not that many ways to punish one toughness creatures in the set, so very few tokens, for instance. Hulking Bugbear is a 3 mana 3 3 goblin with haste, very straightforward. It's an uncommon, so can get in the red zone right away. Goblin, relevant creature type, very least C plus for the Bugbear, assuming we're an aggressive deck. Improvised Weaponry is a 3 mana sorcery at common, dealing 2 damage to any target, and we get to make a treasure token. So, 2 damage not a lot, but it still takes care of some evasive creatures, death touch creatures that might be annoying. And making a treasure token can help us ramp. Of course, excellent in a black red deck specifically, but most decks can make use of a treasure just fine and can help us ramp into bigger stuff, so. Yeah, C plus for improvised weaponry, probably the worst of the three common removal spells compared to the the dragon's fire and the fireball, but uh, yeah, still a reasonable removal spell. Inferno of the Star Mounts is six mana for a six six legendary dragon at mythic, cannot be countered, has flying, has haste, and has fire breathing. And if you somehow get to 20 power, it deals 20 damage to 9 targets. Uh, yeah, this is an S. This will hit the opponent very hard. So it may not have an enter the battlefield ability, but haste is kind of like an enter the battlefield ability. And if the opponent cannot answer it, this will pretty much win the game in two turns. 
Jaded Sellsword is for mana for a 4-3 Dragon Warrior at common. When it enters the battlefield, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, it also gains first strike and haste until end of turn. Yeah, fine filler card. Good for the treasure decks, but 4-3-4-4 four, four, four is still reasonable outside of it. Seems like a good C. Kick in the door is 1 mana sorcery, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. It gains haste until end of turn and cannot be blocked by walls. And we get to venture into the dungeon. Now red's not the color that cares the most about venturing into dungeons. So I'm not super high on kick in the door. So we'll give this a D. Magic Missile is 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, cannot be countered, and deals 3 damage divided as we choose among 1, 2, or 3 targets. So this is one potential way to punish 1 toughness creatures, although realistically this will probably just kill 1 creature, maybe deal some excess damage to the opponent. And if you're lucky, this can line up in such a way that it takes out two creatures. So, yeah, fine removal spell. Three mana, three damage is pretty efficient. So, has the potential to be a two for one. Gets a B from me. Meteor Swarm, X and Triple Red for a rare sorcery. Dealing eight damage, divide it as we choose among X, target creatures and or planeswalkers. So this one takes a second to parse, so if we cast this for 4 mana, it's just 8 damage to one creature, pretty much kills anything, and still pretty efficient. If x equals 2, we can easily take out two different creatures by splitting up that 8 damage, and x equals 3, there's still a chance we can take out three different creatures, although chances do kind of decrease based on the bigger the x gets. So, most common scenario is probably 5 mana, kill 2 creatures, which is very powerful for any card really, so I'll give this an A. Seems like a, a bomb, even if it you know doesn't win the game, it uh, makes it very difficult for the opponent to do so. Minion of the Mighty, a 1 mana a rare kobold, it's an 0-1 with menace. And Pack Tactics lets us put a Dragon Creature card from our hand onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on the Minion of the Mighty. Fun challenge in Constructed, but it's not gonna come together and limit it very often. And an 0-1 Menace body, even if you have some equipment to put on it, is probably not worth the card. So I think this will be an F. Orb of Dragonkind, 2 mana, a rare artifact. Can pay one mana, tap it, and add two mana in any combination of colors that we can only spend on dragon spells or activated abilities of dragons. So this can potentially fix your mana. There's a lot of uncommon dragons that require two mana of any given color, and this by itself can kind of fix for those. And then we can also pay a red mana, tap and sacrifice it, and then look at the top seven cards of our library to find a dragon to put into our hand. This could still enable maybe like a two or three color deck where you splash some dragons that you get past. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of dragons in the set. Maybe you do pick up some of the more powerful rare dragons and this is an extra way to try and get to those. So I'm not gonna quite give this a D, which I would under most circumstances, since this set does have a lot of different dragons even at Uncommon. So I could see this being a, a role player in uh, potentially splashing some dragons as well. Plundering Barbarian, 3 mana for a 2-2 Dwarf Barbarian at common. When it enters, either destroy an artifact or create a treasure token. And we've seen a lot of equipment in this set, so I think this is a perfectly main deckable card. And if you're not facing any equipment, making a treasure still pretty useful, helping you ramp. So, Barbarian seems like a C plus card, and I'm gonna be very happy to have at least one copy in my red decks. It does have a bit of diminishing returns, and of course if the opponent's not playing any artifacts whatsoever, you could consider boarding this out. But even as a 2-2 that makes a treasure, it's not bad. Price of Loyalty is the Act of Treason effect of the set. 
So basically act of treason, but in addition, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast this, the stolen creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So there's a few sacrifice effects in black, for instance, that we can combine with it. So in those decks, this could be useful, but I don't think it's really a heavily supported archetype like we've seen in some previous expansions. So D for Price of Loyalty. A red dragon is 6 mana for a 4-4 dragon at uncommon. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield it deals 4 damage to each opponent. So kind of like attacking with it right away, but we still have it back on defense. So yeah, red dragon joins the other uncommon dragons in the B category. That's just a very solid limited card. Next is Rust Monster, 3 mana for a 2-1 beast at uncommon, has first strike and can sacrifice an artifact to give it plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So the obvious synergy here is with treasure tokens. And again it's the threat of activation that makes a card like this powerful. Even if you're not planning to sacrifice anything, the opponent has to respect that ability. So it's going to be very difficult for the opponent to attack into this on the ground if you have one or two artifacts you're willing to sacrifice. Yeah, anything with first strike I think is going to be even better in the set as it lines up well against the various death touch creatures in black and uh, plays nicely with our equipment. So Rust Monster gets a C+, very solid card. Swarming Goblins, 5 mana for a 4-3 Goblin at common. When it enters the battlefield, roll a d20. Between 1 and 9 makes 1 red goblin token. 10 and 19 make 2 of them. And if we get a 20, we get to make 3 goblin tokens instead. So this is probably the main way to enable those various goblin synergies that we've seen. Although they're mostly at higher rarity. So I don't think it's going to be a major theme. This is also potentially a way to go wide in like a red-white deck perhaps. And make use of the... Anthem effects that we've seen in white. So yeah, this could be a decent role player. Um, doesn't necessarily fit into one of the main themes of the sets. Doesn't necessarily scream equipment synergy or treasure token synergy. So probably it lands somewhere in the C range. But there might be some smaller synergies between this and other cards. That can uh, push it up in value. Tiger Tribe Hunter is a 5 mana 4 4 human barbarian at uncommon with trample. And Pack Tactics is a pretty complicated one. We may sacrifice another creature. If we do, the hunter deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to target creature. So we can fling one of our creatures to uh, potentially take out an opposing creature. And at the same time, it's a 5 mana 4 4 trampler, which isn't bad. So there's a lot to like about the Tiger Tribe Hunter. C plus for Tiger Tribe Hunter. Unexpected Windfall is a 4 mana instant at common. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to discard a card. And then we get to draw 2 and make 2 treasure tokens. So we've seen an effect like this in the past at sorcery speed. And uh, yeah, in this set especially, treasure tokens are more valuable as they can be sacrificed to all sorts of effects. And ramping into big 6 and 7 mana dragons is also going to be a thing. So I like Windfall more than I would in the average limited set. Of course not card advantage, it just filters some cards at its best in the late game when you can discard land, but at the same time could also be used to ramp out something big ahead of schedule, in which case you want to be casting this earlier in the game. So there is a bit of tension there, where you want to cast it both early, but also gets better late. But uh, yeah, unexpected windfall, especially in the black-red archetype that cares about treasures, seems pretty strong. At the end of the day, probably just a C um, for a card that just kind of filters through the deck. But uh, don't underestimate those treasures. Valor Singer is a 3 mana 2 3 Tiefling Bard at common. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So this can target any creature, including itself, but perfect alongside 
another evasive creature that's getting in, or maybe a first striking creature, double striking creature, especially nice. So for a three drop, this seems incredibly powerful, and it's so common. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Valor Singer. It's gonna make it so you almost always have a good attack lined up, and then just sits back as a two three on defense, which isn't too bad. So a C plus for Valor Singer. Wish is a 3-mana rare sorcery. You may play a card you own from outside the game this turn. You have to cast both Wish and the Exiled card in the same turn, or the card from outside the game in the same turn. So that's going to take a lot of mana to cast something impactful, which is probably asking too much in limited. Um, so I don't see myself playing this very often. So we'll give this a D. Zorn is a 3-mana three 3-2 three, elemental at rare, saying if you would create one or more treasure tokens, instead create those tokens plus an additional treasure token instead. Yeah, 3-mana three 3-2 three, with random upside. Gonna be at its best in black-red. Seems fine, C+. You come to the Null Camp. 2-mana instant, you either intimidate them, up to two target creatures cannot block this turn, or you fend them off. Target creature gets plus three plus one until end of turn. Two relatively useful abilities for a more aggressive deck, either a falter effect or a pump spell. That being said, I'm not thrilled about this. I'll give this a D. The pump spell doesn't pump toughness all that much, so most likely still going to result in a trade and only preventing two creatures from blocking, not quite the same as preventing the opponent's entire team from blocking, so both modes are kind of underwhelming here. You find some prisoners, on the other hand, there's a two mana instant at uncommon, letting you choose between breaking their chains, which means destroying an artifact, or interrogating them, which means exiling the top three cards of target opponent's library, choose one of them until end of your next turn, you may play that card and spend mana as a third war mana of any color to cast it. So main deckable artifact removal is quite valuable in the set, since we've seen a lot of powerful equipment already. And having it be a modal card that, in case the opponent doesn't present an artifact to destroy, you can still make use of, is quite useful. And in this case, the interrogating mode seems pretty useful. Exiling three cards gives you a good chance of hitting something relevant. So yeah, I like this quite a bit as a versatile artifact removal spell that can still be cycled in the hopes of finding something nice from the opponent. So at the very least to see. Next up we see a pair of goblins, three mana instant at uncommon, and we either charge them, meaning creatures we control get plus two plus O until end of turn, or we befriend them, making two one one red goblin creature tokens. It's another way to potentially synergize with those goblin cards we've seen earlier. Yeah, fine card. The card being an instant means we can potentially ambush opposing creatures. Although not a ton of one toughness creatures out there that we can punish with this. So probably just a C as kind of a Trumpet Blast that can also make some 1-1 one -one tokens. Zalto Fire Giant Duke is a 5-mana 7-3 a legendary giant barbarian with Trample, and when Zalto is dealt damage, venture into the dungeon. So the most likely use case is Zalto attacks, but on trades off with a 3-powered creature, opponent takes some trample damage and we get to venture into the dungeon, which is not a bad use case. We get to deal some damage, force a trade. Now the best case scenario is, let's say we have a pump spell or maybe a way to give this double strike, then uh, we're definitely in business. So that's kind of the synergy you, you want to look for with Zalto. Also being a seven power creature means it enables the pack tactics all by itself for those red green decks which is also very valuable. So at the very least a C plus, but I could see this going up in value if you value those pack tactics or if you've got some pump spells to synergize with it. 
And then our last red card is another Planeswalker, Zariel, Archduke of Avernus. Four mana, four loyalty. The plus one says creatures you control get plus one plus two and gain haste until end of turn. The zero ability makes a 1-1 red devil creature token that when it dies deals one damage to any target. And the minus six, which we could potentially reach quickly, gives us an emblem saying at the beginning of the first combat phase on our turn, untap target creature we control. After this phase, there's an additional combat phase. Although I imagine most of the time we're just going to be happy making as many devil tokens as possible and then eventually pumping the team. Yeah, Zariel seems quite strong. Can be a bit weak to evasive creatures that can pressure it, but uh, still seems worthy of an A. Bomb level card. First green card is Bullet. Four mana for a 3-3 beast at common, saying at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So at its best in the black green archetype, where we care the most about creatures dying, and it doesn't take much for Bullet to kind of get going one counter and we get a 4 mana 4-4, four four, which is pretty efficient. And it can only get bigger from there. Now it might need that initial push to kind of kickstart it and get that first counter. So yeah, I like a, a C at the very least, but could go up in value the more ways we have of enabling the death trigger. Bull's Strength is 2 mana for an instant, giving a creature plus 2 plus 2, and Trample until end of turn, we also get to untap it. So a fine combat trick if we're in the market for combat tricks. Um, not one of the more exciting ones, but probably still falls in the C category. Choose your weapon, 3 mana instant and uncommon. We either double target creature's power and toughness until end of turn, or we deal 5 damage to a creature with flying. So having this be a modal card is quite useful. 5 damage does take care of most of the scary dragons we've seen, although there's a few exceptions. And then having this be a, a comma trick in case the opponent doesn't have any flyers is still useful. So would much rather, would much rather have this than, let's say, plummets, which is also in the set. So C for choose your weapon as a useful modal card. Circle of Dreams Druid is triple green for a 2-1 elf druid at rare. Taps to add green for each creature you control. So the effect here is undoubtedly powerful. Can easily ramp a ton of extra mana. Problem is the triple green. We're probably going to be a two color deck most of the time and limited. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend first picking this and forcing a mono green deck just because of it. But yeah, being triple green means we can't really expect to cast this on turn 3. And uh, if we're not playing it on turn 3, then the mana advantage it provides also kind of goes down in value over time. So overall, probably give this a C. If you can cast this around turn 4, turn 5, maybe with additional mana fixing or maybe some treasure tokens to help out. It could still be worth it, but uh, this is mostly going to be at its best in Constructed, where you can play it in a mono green deck. Circle of the Moon Druid is a 3 mana 2-4, and as long as it's your turn, it turns into a 4-2 bear instead. So the main thing to keep in mind about this human elf druid at common is that it's a great way to enable the pack tactics, as you'll need six or more power for that to work. So having four power on our three drop is useful. And then during the opponent's turn, it's going to be a two four, so plays defense nicely if we needed to play defense. So not a bad common, just gets a C, fine filler card but can maybe be a bit more valuable in decks that care about pack tactics. Compelled Duel, 2 mana sorcery, giving a creature plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn, and it must be blocked this turn if able. So kind of a lure effect. This being a sorcery means it's not really your typical comma trick, and sorcery speed pump spells aren't great. This 
of course, could have some uh, nice synergies with Death Touch, especially. But it's not saying that each creature must block this creature. Just a single creature has to block it, at least. So it's not really going to be a blowout. So I think D for Compelled Duel, not particularly compelling. Direwolf Prowler, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two Wolf at Common. And has a nice activated ability for 1 and a green, giving it plus 2, plus 2, and haste until end of turn. Although it can only be activated once. So in the late game, can potentially play this and activate it and get in for 4 damage right away. So it's a pretty exciting top deck. And then the threat of, threat of activation again is what makes this card so powerful. You attack this into the opponent's 3-3 and they can't really block. And then of course we don't have to pump and we can spend our mana elsewhere. And then the ability is pretty efficient at only one on a green. So yeah, Direwolf Prowler seems like a very good common. We'll give this a C plus. Typically overperforms. A Druid class, another uncommon enchantment class. This one says whenever land enters a battlefield under your control, you gain one life. So potentially has some synergy with a green-white life gain archetype. Then level 2 for 3 mana says you can play an additional land on each of your turns. Although by the time you activate this, you don't necessarily have a ton of lands left in hand. And then for 5 mana we reach level 3. And then a target land we control becomes a creature with haste and power and toughness equal to the number of lands we control. Yeah, it's a lot of mana to sink into making a land into a creature. The first level not particularly relevant unless we care about gaining life, which is probably a green-white thing, although ramping and uh, having access to more mana is more of a blue-green thing. So, yeah, this card doesn't strike me as particularly powerful. The uh, five mana ability to turn a land into a creature will leave us with potentially a pretty large creature but it's not gonna have any special abilities and uh, we've seen quite a few death touch creatures in the set so yeah not particularly high on druid class pretty big investment and the payoff is pretty minimal although i think the main home for it is going to be a place where Gaining one life each turn with landfall is valued, so I'm thinking green-white. But uh, overall, give this a D. I think this is a pass for me. Eliwick, Tumblestrom, 4 mana Planeswalker, starts out at 4 loyalty. The plus 1 lets us venture into the dungeon. So a nice repeatable way to explore the various dungeons. The minus two lets us take a look at the top six cards of our library, reveal a creature card from among them, put it into our hand. If it's legendary, we also gain three life. And then the minus seven gives us an emblem, where creatures we control have trample, haste, and plus two plus two for each differently named dungeon we've completed. Realistically, in limited, it's maybe going to be one dungeon. So still a nice uh, permanent overrun effect. So... Yeah, if we can protect our Planeswalker, this can easily complete a dungeon for us and eventually give the team an overrun effect. doesn't really protect itself all that well, so we can only really count on this surviving if we've already got a stable board. So, not quite as powerful as some of the other Planeswalkers we've seen, but uh, still demands to be answered eventually, otherwise it can run away with the game. So we'll give Alleywick a B. Elter Guard Rangers, 5 mana for a 4-1 Human Elf Ranger at common, has reach. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to make a 2-2 Green Wolf Creature token. And there's no shortage of powerful flyers in the set. So 4-1 reach can trade off for even some large dragons. And then, even if the opponent does answer the Ranger, we're still left with a 2-2 Wolf token. Yeah, there's a lot to like about this. Also a lot of power to enable pack tactics. In fact, 6 power enables pack tactics by itself. So, C plus for the Ranger in a set where having answers to flyers is important. Find a Path is a 3-man enchantment aura, 
enchant a land, and when it enters battlefield we also get to venture into the dungeon, and the enchanted land taps for double green, so it ramps us by one, and it lets us venture. So yeah, overall not a bad card if we're in the market for some ramp cards. Although green, not the color that's most interested in completing dungeons necessarily. So we'll give Find the Path a C. Frog Hemoth is 5 mana for a 4 4 frog horror. At rare, it has Trample and Haste, and when it deals combat damage to a player, exile up to that many target cards from their graveyard. Put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Frog Hemoth for each creature card exiled this way and we gain one life for each non-creature card exiled this way. So yeah, Frog Hemoth, if it can attack and connect with the opponent right away, and maybe exile some creatures, can easily get out of hand. Um, it's not particularly large by itself, so we are sort of counting on the surprise factor to hopefully grow it the turn we play it. And uh, yeah, once this turns into like a 6-6 six, six or bigger, the opponent's gonna have a hard time to uh, stop it and potentially it'll be able to grow even more. So, um, at the very least a B for Frog Hemoth might push its way into the A category. Sort of depends how many creatures we can reliably exile with it, since uh, the graveyard might not always be very full. Yeah, I think an A for Frog Hemoth. Green doesn't often get haste creatures, so this might be a bit unexpected. Null Hunter, 2 mana for a 2 2. Null. And Pack Tactics lets us put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So this is a, a very powerful 2 drop that can easily snowball out of control and rewards us for getting to that 6 power as quickly as possible. So another reason to like cards like the Circle of the Moon Druids, for instance. So C plus for Null Hunter seems excellent. Green Dragon is our final uncommon dragon, 6 mana for a 4-4 four, four with flying. And when Green Dragon enters the battlefield, until end of turn, whenever a creature an opponent controls is dealt damage, destroy it. So a bit of a strange card. Um, not an effect we're used to seeing in green. Now a 6 mana 4-4 four, four flyer, already pretty decent, and uh, it does potentially enable some attacks that we otherwise couldn't make. Potential good synergy in the black-green deck, thinking of the skeleton enchantment for instance, the opponent's not going to want to block the skeletons, which can then potentially uh, get out of hand. And uh, in red-green, we can potentially combine it with burn spells to take care of bigger creatures as well. There's not real, th there's no real pinger in red that can combine with this. But uh, yeah, overall it's still a bonus ability on top of a 4-4 flyer, which is pretty large. So I like uh, B still for green dragon, and we'll continue the trends of giving them all B. Hill Giant Herd Gorger. So 6 mana, 7-6. Seven, when it enters the battlefield, you gain 3 life. So we trade it 1 life for 1 power. Yeah, overall, fine cards can help us in a racing situation by gaining some life. It's very large, so it will demand an answer. Even if there's a lot of Death Touch creatures out there. And uh, can potentially enable some of the life gain synergies in green-white as well doesn't have trample, so you'll have to figure out a way to grant it evasion to get the most out of it. But yeah, still a creature that will have to be chum blocked multiple times if the opponent doesn't want to die in two attacks. So we'll give the Herd Gorger a C+. I think this will be pretty decent. Hunter's Mark is another one of the hate cycle at uncommon, 4 mana for an instant, although it costs 3 less to cast if it targets a blue permanent we don't control, cannot be countered, and then target creature we control gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, and deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker we don't control. 
So perfect alongside any Death Touch creatures, as they'll be able to take out anything, but for the most part, green shouldn't have any trouble with uh, taking out opposing creatures if we cast Hunter's Mark. So yeah, this one seems pretty strong. It is also an instance, so that's not something we always get with these various uh, bite spells, as they're called. And we'll give this a B. Inspiring Bard, 4 mana for a 3-3 Elf Bard. When it enters the battlefield, we either give a creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn, or we gain 3 life. So, has synergy across various different uh, archetypes, and just a fine filler card. We'll give this a C. Instrument of the Bards is a pretty complicated one. A 1 mana legendary artifact that rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, we may put a harmony counter on it, so it can keep getting counters over time until we don't want it to accumulate more counters. And then we pay for mana, tap it, and search our library for a creature card with mana value equal to the number of harmony counters on the instrument, reveal it, and put it into our hand. And then if it's legendary, we also make a treasure token. So this is a very slow way of generating card advantage. But it does definitely generate card advantage, eventually can pull pretty much all the creatures out of our deck that we care about. So in a grindy game, this will definitely prove its worth. In a matchup where the opponent's very aggressive, we're probably not going to have much time to use it. So kind of depends based on the matchup. But uh, yeah, I'll start out with a C for instrument. Definitely a card that goes up in value and sealed compared to draft which typically ends up being a bit slower paced. Intrepid Outlander is a 2-mana 2-3 two, Orc Ranger at Uncommon, and it has Reach, so incredibly efficiently costed. And Pack Tactics means we can venture into the dungeon if this attacks and we have 6 or more power. Not necessarily the biggest creature, so won't be able to stop some of the larger flyers, but it does line up favorably against most other 2-drops. And the pack tactics letting us venture is just pure upside, even if green's not the primary candidate for venture synergies. So still like a C plus for the Outlander, just an efficiently costed creature. A loathsome Troll is 5 mana for a 6-2 Troll at Uncommon. And for 4 mana, we can roll a d20 if the Troll is in our graveyard. And then between 1 and 9, we can put it on top of our deck. 10 and 19, put it into our hand. And if we roll a natural 20, we can put it straight onto the battlefield. So the Loathsome Troll is going to be quite a pain for some decks to deal with, as it will just keep on coming back. Another reason to like a card like Charmed Sleep to answer it. And having 6 power means it enables the pack tactics all by itself. So going to be at its best in red-green. And uh, yeah, a creature that can keep coming back demands to be at least uh, traded for, as it otherwise deals too much damage, so it can also enable some of the nice black-green death triggers. So yeah, Loadsome Troll seems pretty strong, and uh, can enable a lot of various synergies. It does cost a lot of mana if we have to put it back in our hands and then replay it. Um, so it is kind of a slow engine card. So it's not going to be ideal for every matchup, but we'll give it a C+. Long Rest, X and Triple Green for a rare sorcery, letting us return X target cards with different mana values from our graveyard to our hand. And then if somehow 8 or more cards were returned to our hand this way, we also gain life and go back to our starting life total. So... This is an effect we've definitely seen in the past, returning multiple cards from our graveyard to our hand. Perfect in a long grindy game where we've traded a lot of resources. This will typically be the final nail in the coffin. But uh, yeah, if you have this in your opening hand, you're going to be a little sad. So C plus for long rests. Good for grindy games, better in sealed than draft, typically speaking. But uh, nice to have a bit of card advantage going into the late game if your deck doesn't have any other sources of card advantage otherwise. Lurking Roper, 3 mana for a 4-5 horror at Uncommon. 
doesn't untap during your untap step, but whenever we gain life, we can untap it. So green-white is where the roper's gonna untap more consistently. And there's a few ways to repeatedly gain life, so thinking about the Druid class, for instance, good combo with the Lurking Roper, but sometimes you're just happy to keep a 4-5 on defense, and uh, 3 mana is incredibly efficient. So if your plan is just to play this, keep it back, and eventually ramp into bigger and more powerful things, that's uh, also a valid game plan. So C plus for Lurking Roper. Neverwinter Dryad, single mana for a 1-1 one, one Dryad that we can sacrifice for 2 mana to search our library for a forest card and put it on the battlefield tapped. So Dryad has a lot of things going for it. It's a way to ramp, which is always appreciated in a set trying to cast powerful 6 and 7 mana dragons. It also counts as a way to trigger our various uh, cards that care about a creature dying as we can sacrifice it in our own turn. We can also use this to potentially chum block a large creature from the opponent in their turn and then still sacrifice it afterwards, doing a nice Sakura Tribe Elder impression. And uh, yeah, all for a very low price. Can sacrifice it the same turn we play it since it doesn't care about summoning sickness. So yeah, I think C plus for the Dryad just has a lot going for it, both ramping and enabling those death synergies. Ochre Jelly is X and green for an ooze at rare. It tramples and enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. And then it splits when it dies and it's very intuitive. Basically, you get to half the number of counters when it dies and generate an additional jelly that will keep on reproducing pretty much. Do we give Ochre Jelly a B, or does this sneak closer to an A is where I'm at. Probably still stick to a B. Definitely a very powerful card if you've got the ramp to back it up. Old Knobbone, 7 mana for a 7-7 Mythic Rare a Legendary Dragon. It flies and says whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. Typically when you have 7 mana already you don't need even more mana, so the treasure tokens are, you know, not the most relevant ability. But if you've got some X spells in your deck I guess that's a combo with the Knobbone. But for the most part 7 mana, 7-7 seven, seven dragon with flying, that can maybe generate some treasure the turn you play it, so it has some sort of ETB value. It's just a, a very big scary dragon. Don't think it quite reaches the same level as some of the other mythic rare dragons we've seen, just because it doesn't necessarily have a recursive ability, but uh, yeah, still very powerful, and if it doesn't get answered, it will win you the game. So I think this is closer to an A compared to most of the other mythic rare dragons that got an S. Next is Owl Bear. 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Bird Bear with Trample. When it enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card. So this seems like a great common in green. Reminds me of Sir Wolf's Packmate, which ended up being the best common in the set, pretty much. Now, have to pay the full 5 mana, so there's no paying in uh, small increments, but still very good. 4-4 four, four Trampler that replaces itself. Give this a B for Owl Bear, the Bird Bear. Then we have Plummets. In a set where we have a lot of other ways to deal with flyers, I don't think we're gonna main deck Plummet very often, but a 2 mana instant to destroy a creature with flying. Classic in these uh, types of core sets. And the art's very pretty too, but uh, probably still give this a D. Excellent sideboard card if you need it. Prosperous Innkeeper, 2 mana, 1-1 one, one, Halfling Citizen and Uncommon. When the innkeeper enters a battlefield, we get to make a treasure token, and whenever another creature enters a battlefield under our control, we gain one life. So similar to a soul warden, or I guess more accurately, it's the orator. So in the green-white life gain synergy deck, this is going to be at its best. There's not a ton of life gain payoffs necessarily, so I wouldn't overvalue it, but still a two mana one one that's kind of ramps us is uh, pretty neat. 
so probably closer to a C. But in a dedicated green-white life gain deck, this might be closer to a C+. Purple Worm, 7 mana, 8, 7. That costs 2 generic mana, less to cast if a creature died this turn. And uh, yeah, not too difficult to enable that. Around turn 5, which is when we could cast this for the discount, is probably around the time where creatures start trading off in combats. And then it also has a ward 2. So if we can cast this for 5 mana, an 8-7 with ward 2 is incredibly strong. And then even for 7 mana it's still reasonable. So liking the purple worm a lot, we'll give this a B. Ranger class is uh, at least on par, if not better, than the Westgate Regent, which gets the price for most pushed rare. Not talking about mythics, but just rares. So let's go over Ranger class 2 mana for an enchantment class at rare. First level we get a 2-2 wolf creature token, so 2 mana 2-2, two -two, not bad. Next level 2 pays we have to pay 2 mana to get to level 2. And then we essentially get a sparring regimen, or at least very close to it, saying whenever we attack, put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature. It doesn't untap it, but close enough. And then level 3 for 4 mana, we may look at the top card of our library at any time and cast creature spells from the top of our library. So yeah, this card kind of does it all. It uh, makes our creatures bigger, it finds creatures, it makes a creature, and uh, yeah, every single step of the way is relatively efficiently costed. So yeah, Ranger class is a beating and gets an S. Rangers, longbow, two mana, equipment at common, giving the equipped creature plus two plus one and reach, and costs three mana to equip. So, pretty expensive, although reach useful in a set full of powerful dragons. And plus two plus one and reach means almost any creature is going to be able to trade off for one of those bigger flyers. So even though it's kind of expensive, I'm still liking access to at least one ranger's longbow in most green decks. So probably puts it in the C category. Scaled Herbalists, 2 mana for a 1-3 Lizard Druid that can tap to put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield. An effect we've definitely seen in the past, usually not very good. Might make an exception in like a blue-green deck that cares about having access to a ton of mana, but uh, still falls in the D category. Just gonna run out of lands pretty quickly, even if you cast this on turn 2, so has pretty limited utility. Spoils of the Hunt, a 3 mana instant. Target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn for each mana from a treasure that was spent to cast this. But uh, don't worry, this card's still totally fine without any treasures, because that creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature an opponent controls. So kind of like a rabbit bite at instant speed for 3 mana, even without any treasures. So still very good and on a similar power level to the 4-mana uh, uncommon variants, so we'll give this a B as well. And then Sylvan Shepherd, 3-mana 2-3, Human Druid at common with Vigilance, and when a Shepherd attacks we roll a d20. And if we get between 1 and 9 we gain 1, 10 and 19 we gain 2, and 20 we gain 5. So yeah, Shepard I guess enables some of the life gain synergies. We can see the unicorn in the background. So you want to pair this with the 3 mana white unicorn. So it can pick up more plus 1 counters. I guess it's a way to untap our roper as well. So there's a few synergies spread, around, spread out across the set that uh, care about the small life gain increments. Although 2-3 vigilance for 3 is nothing exciting. So, just a C, fine filler card. Next is the Terrasque, 9 mana for a 10-10 legendary creature dinosaur at Mythic. 
9 mana is a lot of mana. No real way to cheat this into play, just gotta ramp into it the old fashioned way, maybe using treasures. Do we win the game if we cast this is the question. The answer is pretty much. It has haste and ward 10 as long as it was cast. So it makes it impossible for the opponent to kill it with spot removal. And when the Tarasque attacks, it fights target creature defending player controls. Now one way you could still kind of beat it is with death touch creatures. Since uh, fighting is not going to save it there. And uh, also wouldn't be able to attack into any death touch creatures. It doesn't trample, so it can be chum blocked for a while. Although it's going to take out opposing creatures left and right. Yeah, this card's incredibly powerful. Problem is getting to 9 mana. Powerful card, and will usually win the game if you get to it. But getting to it is the main challenge. Underdark Basilisk is one way to stop the Tarasque. A 2 mana 1 2 Basilisk with Death Touch. At common, so plays well with those various bite effects we've seen in green. Not incredibly exciting, doesn't have reach or anything. So no deadly recluse, but still an okay defensive card if we need a 2-drop, so we'll give this a C. Can potentially pair well with equipment, making it difficult for the opponent to uh, block it profitably, but uh, still not incredibly exciting. Varys Silvery Moon Ranger on the other hand, quite strong, 3 mana for a 3-3 a legendary human elf ranger, has a reach and a war to 1. And whenever we cast a creature or planeswalker spell, we get to venture into a dungeon. Can only trigger once each turn. And whenever we complete a dungeon, we get to make a 2-2 wolf token. So by itself, it's a totally serviceable card. And then has additional value whenever we play creatures, which is something that happens naturally in a game of limited. And then a few wolf tokens can potentially be generated as well. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Varus. At the very least gets a B, and in a deck with more Venture Synergy could even be more valuable. Wandering Troubadour might be my favorite art in the set. 4 mana for a 4-2 Dragon Bard at Uncommon. At the beginning of your end step, if you had a land enter the battlefield under your control this turn, venture into the dungeon. So, yeah, nice repeatable way to venture into the dungeon. 4 mana, 4-2, four not the best stats, although high power means it can help us enable those pack tactics, potentially. So, yeah, maybe in a green-white venture deck that cares less about life gain synergies and more about completing dungeons, this is going to be very useful. So, overall, give this a C+. Werewolf Pack Leader, double green for a 3-3 human werewolf at rare. And Pack Tactics lets us draw a card. So, very efficiently costed, not too difficult to at least draw one card with it. And as if that weren't enough, for 4 mana until end of turn, it turns into a 5-3 Trampler. Now, still has 3 toughness, so even the threat of activation isn't gonna help the fact that the opponent blocking it with 3 power is going to result in a trade, but that it can also make it easier to enable the pack tactics if we activate it before attacking. So, it can potentially be a nice plant for the future Innistrad sets, as it has relevant creature types, but uh, yeah, as far as limited goes, still an excellent card, and at the very least worthy of a B. Wild Shape is an interesting one, single green for an instant add on common, and we can choose one until end of turn, target creature we control has base power and toughness and becomes that creature type and gains that ability. So either a 1-3 turtle with hexproof, a 1-5 spider with reach, or a 3-3 elephant with trample. Now this set doesn't have a ton of plus one plus one counters, that would carry over on top of that base power and toughness, which uh, is unlike Strixhaven where we had those fractals with plus one counters, which uh, is a set where this would have been much more powerful. So the 1-3 Hexproof can protect our creature from removal, 1-5 Reach can maybe block a flyer, although 
It doesn't necessarily help us kill a flyer unless there's equipment involved. And then 3-3 three, three Trample, I guess, if we need to deal those last points of damage. So it's a very interesting card, and I love the design, although I'm still kind of uh, hesitant to call this a great limited card, even though it has a lot of flexibility outside of foiling a removal spell with Hexproof. I don't really see the 1-5 Reach and the 3-3 Trample being incredibly relevant. So probably still a D for Wild Shape, but hopefully I'm proven wrong, because this is definitely a type of card I would like to see more of. You find a Cursed Idol, 2 mana sorcery. We choose one between destroying target artifacts, destroying an enchantment, or creating a treasure token and venturing into the dungeon. So this is a perfectly main deckable card in this format, where there's a lot of powerful enchantments, thinking of the classes, and of course no shortage of artifacts with all the equipment. And then if still the opponent doesn't present any of those, we can always uh, make a treasure to ramp and venture into the dungeon, which, uh, if you look at the dungeon cards, is still somewhat useful, even on the first level, and you don't have any other ways to venture. So, yeah, finding a cursed idol gets a C from me. Happy to have at least one in every green deck. You happen on a glade, 3 mana instant at uncommon. You either journey on, search your library for up to 2 basic land cards, reveal them and put them into your hand. So it doesn't ramp, but it just ensures that we don't miss our land drops. Or we can make camp and return a permanent card from our graveyard to our hand. So a very flexible card, and both modes are useful. Um, searching two basic lands is a 2 for 1, even if it doesn't ramp. It can still fix our mana, as we can find any basic. And then returning a permanent can be useful in the late game, once we don't need the lands anymore, to get back one of our best cards. So, yeah, this card seems pretty decent, and uh, at the very least worthy of a C. You meet in a tavern, 4 mana sorcery at uncommon. Can either form a party, which means looking at the top 5 cards of our library, revealing any number of creature cards from among them and put those into our hand. Or we can start a brawl, although not a historic brawl, and creatures we control get plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So both modes are somewhat useful and kind of balance each other out. If we're already very far ahead on board, we can use the second mode to potentially close out the game. If we don't have a lot of creatures, we can use the first mode to hopefully find them. The problem being that we're not super likely to get a ton of value out of the first mode. Looking at the top 5 cards, if we're lucky, we find two creatures. But uh, there's definitely a fail rate there. If you've ever played with Lead the Stampede, you'll know. So, plus 2, plus 2 to the team can be useful in some board states, but there's other board states where it doesn't really matter since it's not going to end the game on the spot, and uh, yeah, if you're on the back foot, then it's not incredibly helpful. You meet in a tavern, gets a C. Alright, first artifact is Bag of Holding. One mana, uncommon artifact, says whenever we discard a card, exile that card from our graveyard, for 2 mana we can tap to draw and discard, for 4 mana we can sacrifice a bag to return all cards exiled with it to its owner's hand. So this used to be a rare, now reprinted as an uncommon. Always a reasonable card, never too exciting, but can definitely help out in the late game getting rid of lands, or in the early game can help us hit our land drops, discard some powerful spells that we can later still get back once we sacrifice the bag. So, yeah, overall, a, a fine inclusion in any limited deck, but probably not much more than that, so we'll give it a C. A C. The deck of many things is a 5-mana Mythic Rare Legendary Artifact, and this is a pretty wild one. We can pay 2 mana, tap it, to roll a d20, and then we subtract the number of cards in our hand from that result. So if we're empty-handed, we're good, but if we have a lot of cards in hand, this can potentially be dangerous, 
because if the result is zero or less, we have to discard our hand. Then if the final result is between one and nine, after subtracting, we return a card at random from our graveyard to our hand. If we get between 10 and 19, we get to draw two cards. And if we roll a natural 20, and if we roll a natural 20, which is only going to happen if we're empty handed, we can put a creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. And when that creature dies, its owner loses the game. So its owner is kind of the uh, imperative word here, because it means if we can steal an opposing creature from the opponent's graveyard, then if that creature dies, the opponent will lose the game. So that's the idea with the uh, last ability here. This seems like a powerful card draw engine. If we are empty handed, we've got a good chance of just drawing two cards and then we can empty our hand again for the following turn. And uh, even getting back cards at random from our graveyard still extra card advantage. So it's a bit slow to get going. Getting that first activation is going to cost us a lot of mana. But uh, assuming there's a bit of a board stall going on, this will eventually take over the game. And as an artifact, we can play this in any deck. So it's kind of the perfect first pick since it doesn't commit us to any color. So yeah, uh, there's a lot to like about the deck of many things and probably going to lead to some fun moments as well. Overall, we'll give this a B. And next is dungeon map as displayed in the background, a 3-mana artifact and uncommon that taps for colorless, or we can pay 3-mana, tap it, and then venture into the dungeon, can only be used at sorcery speed. So, fine ramp card, doesn't fix our mana, but helps us get to those expensive 6 and 7 mana plays, and then a useful mana sink that uh, we can always make use of, especially useful for the more dedicated venture decks, of course. So, yeah, the dungeon map gets a C plus from me. Next is Eye of Vecna. This is part of the Mythic Rare uh, Book of Vile Darkness that we covered earlier. Although still, of course, a fine card by itself. As a two mana legendary artifact that rare, when it enters the battlefield, we draw a card and lose two life. And at the beginning of our upkeep, we may pay two mana, and if we do, we get to draw and lose two life. So a bit of a main, a bit of a painful maze mind tome, and uh, this is potentially a way to enable those synergies that care about us losing life, like the uh, Book of Vile Darkness, I suppose. So at its best in a deck that can maybe gain some life to offset the life loss, and then this will be a useful card draw engine, although. Just got to be careful about managing your life total. But overall, C plus for Eye of Vecna. Usually can afford to pay a bit of life for card advantage and limited. 50 feet of rope, single mana for an artifact at uncommon. We can either climb over, meaning target wall cannot block this turn. We can tie up, 3 mana tap it to prevent a creature from untapping during its next untap step. Or we can repel down, which is 4 mana, to venture into the dungeon. So all modes could be useful. There's not too many walls in the set, but you never know. But uh, yeah, this can be kind of a, a last resort answer for a problematic creature until you find a better solution and uh, always a useful mana sink to venture into the dungeon. So yeah, similar to the dungeon map, it's a bit more expensive to venture, and of course it doesn't ramp us, but uh, having that removal option is nice. So, falls somewhere between a C and a C plus. Probably go with a more conservative C for now. A great axe is not so great, but can potentially have its moments. A one mana equipment at common, equipped creature gets plus four plus O. Oh but the equip cost is quite prohibitive at 5 mana. So the only situation where Great Axe is going to make the cut is if we have lots of ways to discount its equip cost, whether that's with the uh, red-white fighter class or with the 
four mana brain or a battle hammer which can potentially uh, make it free to equip or various equipment so that's the synergy we're looking for with great axe otherwise not a card we want to include so we'll give this a d hand of vecna completes the three card cycle three mana legendary artifact equipment at rare at the beginning of combat on your turn, equipped creature or creature you control named Vecna gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards in your hand. And then the equip cost is either 2 mana, or we can pay 1 life for each card in our hand. So, potentially a powerful equipment if we can sustain it with enough card draw. And then we can either choose the painful option, or we can spend 2 mana to equip it. So, not a bad card. Lands somewhere in the C plus range as well, similar to the Eye of Vecna. Iron Golem is 4 mana for a 5 3 Golem at uncommon, has vigilance and has to attack or block each combat if able. So, we've seen cards like this in the past. People tend to kind of underestimate cards like these since you're used to, of course, disliking effects that force you to attack. Or a block, but uh, the stats we get here are pretty reasonable. 5 3 means it's pretty difficult for the opponent to block it profitably without losing their own creature, and uh, vigilance means it's playing offense and defense, so it's going to force the opponent to eventually trade for it. Now, whether we're trading up or down for mana kind of depends on the situation, although there's quite a few 3 powered 3 mana creatures out there that can just trade for the golem at a mana advantage. But if you can back this up with any uh, pump spells or equipment, then uh, the golem could be pretty problematic for the opponent. So think C plus overall for Iron Golem, a card that you're probably going to be happy to include in most decks. Leather Armor is one mana for an equipment at common. Equipped creature gets plus O plus one and has ward one. And we can equip it for zero mana, although can only use it once each turn. Yeah, just not a very impactful card. Um, even though it's free to equip, which is nice, it just doesn't do enough by itself. So we'll give this a D. Mimic is a two mana artifact treasure. So even though it's not a treasure token, it still counts as a treasure for all those treasure synergies in the set can tap it and sacrifice it to add one mana of any color, similar to a regular treasure token, or we can turn it into a 3-3 creature until end of turn for 2 mana. Not particularly powerful, give this a D. Spare Dagger, 1 mana equipment at common, equips for 1 mana, giving plus 1 plus 0, so very cheap to play and equip, although the power increase is also marginal. And whenever the equipped creature attacks, we can sacrifice the spare dagger, and if we do, deal one damage to any target. Again, there's not a ton of high value one toughness creatures in the set where we would want spare dagger. So, not super excited by this, even though it's cheap to play and equip, just not impactful enough. Also, gets a D. Spiked Pit Trap is one mana for an artifact with flash at common. And for 5 mana we can tap and sacrifice it, choose target creature, and then roll a d20. If we get between 1 and 9, we deal 5 damage to that creature. Between 10 and 20, which is a little bit more likely, we deal 5 damage and get to make a treasure token. So we're dealing 5 damage no matter what. This is a set where there's not a ton of quality removal available, especially in colors like blue and white. The removal is quite scarce. So, Spiked Pit Trap might make the cuts more often than you would expect in a regular set. So I think this gets a C, just a fine filler card. Treasure Chest might be fun, but isn't incredibly powerful. 3 mana rare artifact, for 4 mana we can sacrifice it and roll a d20. If we roll a 1, we get trapped and lose 3 life. Between 2 and 9, we make 5 treasure tokens. So we still didn't make up for the 7 mana we spent on it. Between 10 and 19, we gain 3 and draw 3. So this is the most likely outcome, but of course if we don't, then we're going to be pretty sad. 
And then if we roll a 20, can search our library for any card. If it's an artifact, we may put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, can put it into our hand. Yeah, just uh, a lot of mana for not necessarily the desired outcome. So we'll give this a D. And then we get to the lands, and we've got a nice cycle of monocolored creature lands. Cave of Frost Dragon. If we control two or more other lands, it enters a battlefield tapped, and the other ones are going to be similar. Taps for white mana, and for five mana turns into a 3-4 white dragon with flying until end of turn. It's still a land. So this one's one of the better ones, it's a nice evasive creature. Gets a B. Then of the bugbear is the red variant, and turns into a 3-2 goblin creature that whenever it attacks makes a 1-1 red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. Costs 4 mana to activate. This one's a little bit less exciting since it's easier to block a 3-2 by the time you activate this, but still a card you're very happy to have in any deck playing red. So C+. Then Dungeon Descent enters battlefield tapped, taps for colorless mana, and for 4 mana we can tap it and tap an untapped legendary creature we control to venture into a dungeon. There's a few legendary creatures even at Uncommon, but not that many that uh, Dungeon Descent's going to be an auto include. So probably closer to a C. Although it could be a nice mana sink for decks that have a few legendaries. Evolving Wilds provides a nice bit of mana fixing in a set that otherwise doesn't have many. So at the very least a C+. Hall of Storm Giants is one of those creature lands. For 6 mana turns into a 7-7 seven, seven giant with ward 3. So it can hit pretty hard. Gets a B as well. Hive of the Eye Tyrant turns into a 3-3 three, three Beholder with Menace. And when this creature attacks, it exiles a card from the defending player's graveyard. So the Menace, I think, still makes this into a B, as it's going to be harder to block. Just wait until the opponent only has one creature back to activate this. And then Lair of the Hydra, also a nice mana sink for X and a green, turns into an XX green Hydra creature. So the perfect mana sink for any green deck. Gets a B as well. So all of these lands are excellent, and you're gonna happy to have any of them, and pretty high picks as well. And then Temple of the Dragon Queen, kind of similar to Evolving Wilds can fix our mana, as we can choose a color when it enters battlefields, and then add one mana of any of the chosen colors. And it enters battlefields tapped, unless we can reveal a dragon card from our hand, or if we control a dragon. So even without dragons, this is totally fine, and gets a C plus at the very least, probably a bit better if you've got some dragons, of course. And then last but not least, Treasure Vault. An artifact land at rare taps for colorless, and double X can tap and sacrifice it to create X treasure tokens. So technically this ramps us if we activate this for X equals 2, so 4 mana tap and sacrifice, make 2 treasures, then on the following turn we're potentially ahead of mana. Of course we lost our treasure vault, so it's kind of a one-time use deal. And those treasure tokens could potentially come in handy for any treasure synergies, especially black red, of course, can make good use of those extra treasures. So yeah, in a deck that cares about treasures or wants to ramp into something big, I would be happy to include this, otherwise it might be a pass. So get somewhere around a C. As I've mentioned at the start as well, if you want access to updated card ratings as I play the set more, make sure to subscribe on Twitch or become a patron, which is the best way to support the channel and definitely helps me out. And you'll get access to all my tier lists for limited that are up to date, including this latest one for Forgotten Realms, over 14 different uh, set reviews up to date. And uh, yeah, I think that's gonna wrap things up for today's stream. I wanna thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.